Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. Ah. And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Thursday, December 20th, 2018. My name is Michael Brooks, and I'm Michael Thursday, and this is the five time award winning majority report. We're broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America downtown Brooklyn, USA. On today's program, Kelly Weil. She's a reporter for the Daily Beast. We're talking about the algorithms of the right-wing hate machine online. How does a Google search, a YouTube search on atheism lead you down a treacherous, disgusting path? What's the business model behind it? And of course, we'll probably also dunk on some of these personalities. The ever dumb, ever dim, ever odious Dave Rubin appears on a Bolsonaro aligned Brazilian network. Speaking of which, Como se dice fascism? Como se dice fascism? Uh, Just love ideas. Yeah, that impression is almost too nice to how absolutely craven, disgusting, and immoral Dave Rubin is. In related Brazil news, A court ruling yesterday from the Supreme Court would have seen the release of political prisoner and former President Lula da Silva, prompting an emergency meeting of the military and an extra constitutional move by another Supreme Court justice. We'll touch on this case as it illustrates the descent of Brazil to full dictatorship. Donald Trump is pulling out of Syria entirely. He probably had no idea how many troops we had there as he announces a major new arms deal with Erdogan. But what of the Rojava uprising? Something that we're going to need to be thinking about and dealing with after Trump's very characteristically jackass announcement. General Mattis is losing currency in the administration. The Senate passes a stopgap to avert a government shutdown. And the Trump administration aims to toughen work requirements for food stamps because there isn't enough raw human suffering in this country for Republicans. They, of course, need more. Positive news, a judge blocks Jeff Sessions' ridiculous assertion and redefinition of asylum not applying to gang members. A five-month-year-old girl has been hospitalized with pneumonia after being uh, detained at the Border Patrol. I guess they want to be uh, have being responsible for the negligence and death of many children, apparently. Wilbur Ross twice told federal ethics officials he divested the stock months before he finally did. And here's one breakthrough of Cuba. Major League Baseball reaches a deal with the Cuban, Be- Feder- Cuban Baseball Federation to allow players to enter the United States. I think that's cool. I think that's great. I think that's also an interesting signal of our priorities. All that, plus Bernie Sanders and Dianne Feinstein voiced their opposition to the Senate BDS free speech suppression bill. All that and much, much more on today's Majority Report. Donald Trump yesterday gave me a hashtag resistance moment, which is a moment where I watched Donald Trump say something and I went, I can't believe that this airhead, this buffoon, this moron, this jackass, this dunce, this idiot, this fool is our president. This is so embarrassing. Even when Obama was flying drones everywhere and supporting horrible trade agreements, he carried himself with some friggin' dignity and intelligence. This guy's a moron. I had that resistance moment because Donald Trump announced uh, the end of Syrian military operations 
the other day, or yesterday, in front of the White House in a brief video. Now, there's multiple fronts of U.S. kinetic activity. In fact, at least seven countries, the U.S. under Trump, are regularly hitting with drone strikes. Rules and caps on civilian casualties are completely out the window. Already many civilians, of course, died as the Obama administration continued the essential infrastructure of the Bush global war on terrorism and expanded it in Yemen, Somalia, and other places. But Trump has totally lifted all caps. So we've seen massive increases in civilian casualties and the use of drones since he's taken office. Of course, Afghanistan, we've been there longer than in Vietnam. No end in sight for that brutal, pernicious war. And yet we're pulling entirely out of Syria which we almost entirely should. However, there is one big question mark around this and also a legacy of our own massive contribution to the civilian death toll in Syria, as well as funding through the Gulf of Salafis groups that, of course, Trump is not only going to ignore here, he's going to go off in a very weird and, frankly, disrespectful to our troops tangent. Here is the uh, moron that runs this country yesterday talking about withdrawing from Syria. We've been fighting for a long time in Syria. I've been president for almost two years, and we've really stepped it up. And we have won against ISIS. We've beaten them, and we've beaten them badly. We've taken back the land. And now it's time for our troops to come back home. I get very saddened when I have to write letters or call parents or wives or husbands of soldiers who have been killed fighting for our country. It's a great honor. We cherish them, but it's heartbreaking. There's no question about it. It's heartbreaking. Jesus. Now we've won. It's time to come back. They're getting ready. You're going to see them soon. These are great American heroes. These are great heroes of the world because they fought for us, but they've killed ISIS. Who hurts the world? And we're <laughs> proud to have done it. And I'll tell you, they're up there looking down on us, and there is nobody happier or more proud of their families to put them in a position where they've done such good for so many people. I really feel like the whole subtext of this video is he's trying to get out from having to call dead soldiers families. He's like, what if I, if I really put it out in the video that this is really super bad, then can I skip the calls? It's so heartbreaking. So heartbreaking. So I do believe it's anxiety uh, inducing for him. I mean, this is a oh, guy yeah. who's like freaked out by stares. I could only imagine it's freaky to call uh, the family of a loved one who's died overseas in a unnecessary U.S. imperial adventure. You still support my presidency, right? Right. You still sorry about your son. Besides that, how would you say I'm doing on economy? You know, your son had loyalty. That's what I respect. Said, I respect that because well, they do this thing where they make people unloyal for the FBI and Comey. When he first got into office and there was a, an attack over there where a few soldiers died, didn't he, like, promise to donate a certain amount of money to one of the uh, soldiers' like memorial funds Checks and, like, in the never mail. did it? And was Checks like, in the mail. I can imagine being like, listen, I can't keep making these men this many yeah. promises. Yeah. I mean, it's one thing to lie to a couple of dozen soldiers' families that you're going to help a funeral cost, but by the time uh. you get into the thousands, I mean... That's a lot of IOUs that are never going to be My charity's cashed. gone, folks. It's, <laughs> it's so heartbreaking the yeah. way they make me turn off Fox and Friends when yeah. I have to write these letters. <laughs> Which I definitely write myself. And by the way, in full resistance mode, his hands actually legit are small. Like, I don't, I've never, honestly, like, I, I thought it was funny because it bothered him so hey, much. He looks like but a I, Cheeto. I, <laughs> he looks like a Cheeto. I was going to say, it's Kofi Annan. <laughs> yeah, Kofi <laughs> Annan. <laughs> How does it feel to have your sleepover with Putin? You know what? Um, you are nothing. I was looking at Rick Wilson's Everyone book because they sent it to us for some reason. And Rick the, Wilson is our patriot. The last line is, and by the way, he has small hands. No way. I swear to God. No. Yeah. <laughs> Saw a guy reading that outside the park at the end of the summer. Just like getting both sides. Liberals are such easy marks. Could you imagine? This guy builds his whole... Rick Wilson is a Republican strategist who's built his whole career on electing people to office that are forwarding and advancing all of the policies that Donald Trump is putting into play. And it's like 
a whole it, there's a whole bunch of people who could just be like, hey, you know what? I appreciate Rick that you get that overt racism and misogyny uh, isn't great. Thanks, and uh, we'll take it from here. Instead, this guy gets to become a celebrity on the weight of tweeting against Donald Trump after a year of damaging American life. It's embarrassing. Yeah, so the last two paragraphs are, he he's, leaves with a Churchill quote, which I'm not going to bother to oh, read, Jesus, and then skip it. also, Trump has tiny, tiny hands. Oh, shut the fuck up. <laughs> shut up. Ugh. I hope Trump roasts him. I hope Trump gets it. I hope that like before I hope Trump loses, gets indicted, and then in the brief interim before he goes to jail, he gets an opportunity to do like a final roast of like people like Rick Wilson before they oh, before they be before awesome. they take before they take down his Twitter. That's account. how he wins twenty twenty. It, that's the terrifying scenario. Yeah, just if roasts he can, with Rick yeah, Wilson. If he could just if he could just if he could just lean into David Frum and Rick Wilson, he has a chance. Uh but look, there's a serious thing here. Um, just concluded a great interview with Samuel Moyne, uh, which I'll talk about more later. On He wrote a really important book called uh, Not Enough, Human Rights in the Age of Inequality. And we have been exiting this myth of humanitarian interventionism and realizing that the rhetoric of human rights has served as a proxy for U.S. foreign policy interests. And it's been applied in not only a radically inconsistent way, but also has led to uh, at least partially to horrific atrocities um, like the invasion of Iraq and um, disasters like the assault on Libya. In Syria, there's a multi-party civil war. Nobody likes the reality of this. Every single party involved in Syria is responsible for a massive civilian death, death toll. Assad, the forces that back Assad, including, of course, Russia and Iran, as well as the United States and its Gulf uh, allies. And then ISIS is a, a connected somewhat to Turkey in the Gulf and a, in some respects its own sort of entity, but it couldn't have risen, I think, clearly without some forms of support from the Gulf uh, and, and Turkey. I don't see how that would be possible. And they commit massive atrocities. The Kurds in Rojava have an anarchist confederalist experiment it's one that is global in its implications because of the success of the model and things that we should all be learning from it and it's also a, a part of a justified struggle for kurdish autonomy and uh, determination and uh, nobody should oppose that period it, of course it doesn't mean everybody condemns any type of attack on turkish civilians and any type of terrorist activity 100 percent, of course but the Kurds are absolutely right about their repression in both Iraq and Turkey and elsewhere. And they've been able to carve out a very respectable, laudable experiment here, as well as being credible, effective fighters against ISIS and holding off uh, a genocidal Turkish campaign, which is really what it will be. Now, there are about 2,000 U.S. forces in that region that have already begun withdrawals. In conjunction with this uh, withdrawal, Trump just inked a $3.5 billion missile sale agreement to Turkey, which includes 80 Patriot missiles and 60 Pac-3 uh, missile interceptors. Russia has also negotiated a separate deal uh, with Turkey as well. There's no doubt that part of the adroit play that Erdogan had putting pressure on MBS and humiliating the Saudis after their uh, torture and murder of Jamal Khashoggi in the Turkish in the Saudi embassy uh, Saudi embassy in Istanbul helped facilitate this move on Trump's part so this is a very important time to uh, on the merits be supportive of a broader withdrawal but also realize that there's going to be some immediate humanitarian consequences to a precipitous one first and foremost the betrayal of the Kurds of Rojava, which of course the U.S. were never serious allies of in any way to begin with. But just as I'm a fierce opponent of many aspects of Russian foreign policy, of course U.S. foreign policy, but I'll tell you what, if Russia uh, building m more investment in relationships with Venezuela, as an example, helps see off a U.S. coup, that's a good thing, right? So there was a function of U.S. presence there was supporting 
uh, a noble, correct, and right experiment. And the Turkish official, Turkish government is already talking about hunting people down ditch to ditch and waging a campaign of mass murder in this region. I don't know the answer to this. I just know the complexity of it. And I know that we should certainly still be fueling the Kurdish Kurds in Rojava with weapons. We should certainly still, I would, I would, if I were president, I would keep some presence there and I would keep some intelligence and logistical support. And we need to not go into despair. We need to affirm our solidarity and I'll be doing a lot more coverage on this. But I do want to put that one piece of the real complexity on the table. All right. Today's show one of the, uh, is brought to you by privacy.com slash majority. Privacy.com is a totally free service that lets you buy anything online without having to give out a credit card number, and it lets you prevent companies from overcharging you. Here's how it works. I'm incredibly excited about this. You just take a couple of minutes to link your bank account to your privacy.com account. And then you're able to create virtual credit card numbers, which are linked to your bank account. You can create as many virtual cards as you want. You can delete them. You can freeze them and unfreeze them. And you can set limits on each card. It's great for signing up for free trials because you can just create a virtual card once and delete it, knowing that you'll never be charged once the trial is over. And it protects you when companies get hacked and people's information is stolen because you're not giving out your real credit card number. Equifax, everyone. Each card is locked to a merchant. So you're totally protected against fraud and unauthorized use of your card. Privacy.com's mobile app and desktop browser extension make it incredibly easy to manage your wallet of virtual cards and allow you to for to autofill your virtual cards at the click of the button when you're shopping online. There are countless different advantages to using services like this to pay your bills and buy things online. You can find out more and get 100% free and unlimited access by going to privacy.com slash majority. And we've put a link underneath this video if you're watching on YouTube. We're going to take a brief break. We'll be right back with Kelly Weil. Party Report, Michael Brooks here. Joining us now is Kelly Weil. She is a reporter for The Daily Beast. Kelly, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Kelly, you cover some of the worst swamps of the Internet uh, for The Daily Beast, and you've written a new piece called How to Build a Radicalization Machine for the Far... Uh, how YouTube Built a Radicalization Machine for the Far Right. Start us off by explaining how and it would almost certainly be a young man, would start an uh, internet search for, say, uh, you know, I don't know, why Christianity isn't real or uh, why religion is wrong or, you know, how to be an atheist. How does that search end up through algorithms and through symbiotic networks, uh, in many cases, lead to a path towards white nationalism, as an example? Right. So you have to understand that YouTube has this algorithm that recommends things that it thinks you want to watch because the longer you're on the site, the more money you're making for them through ad placement. So there's nothing inherently wrong with, say, religious debate videos or atheism videos. But 
there's a kind of reactionary undercurrent in some of the atheist community online um, where they don't just talk about religion. They also uh, talk about anti-feminism. And sometimes there's Islamophobic strains to it. Um, so because there is that tie, sometimes when you're watching an atheist video, you'll get recommendations for things that are more fringe on the right. And if you click on that, it'll recommend the uh, next fringe idea until you can find yourself quite far uh, into the weeds. And I think for people who this process happened on slowly, they don't even realize how far they've gone. Can you talk about this kid, 15-year-old David Sherritt, um, as a sort of case study in what you're talking about? Yeah, so David started watching actually Call of Duty videos when he was about 15. And that's really common for uh, especially young men. Um, and he said from there he started getting recommendations for religious debate. That's a really popular genre on YouTube, so it's not really that surprising that he may have seen it. Mm -hmm. um, and from there, he went from atheism videos to uh, anti-feminist videos, which really kind of brought him into the overall uh, – genre of videos that are opposed to social justice. Um, and he fortunately was able to kind of snap out of that um, last year. He's no longer in that circle, but a lot of young men don't find a way out. And so from a business perspective, because I think in some ways we need to start like reshaping the debate to be about these platforms themselves and the functions they're actually serving or not serving writ large you get more specifically into this sort of like you quote Becca Lewis, who's a researcher at uh, data and society. And she says, fixation on watch time can be banal or dangerous in terms of, the, excuse me, that's you. Now this is uh, Becca Lewis in terms of YouTube's business model and attempts to keep users engaged in their context content. It makes sense that what we're seeing the algorithms do. The algorithmic behavior is great if you're looking for makeup artists and you watch one person's content and want a bunch of other people's advice on how to do your eyeshadow. But it becomes a lot more problematic when you're talking about political and extremist content. Now, I guess my question for you is obviously, you know, just as like a simple statement about content, of course, that's true, right? Like if you're following makeup tutorials or sports highlights that's obviously way more innately positive and less dangerous than, uh, you know, watching uh, misogynistic videos, as an example. But the broader sort of like environment we're in of these really tightly sort of self-reinforcing feedback loops with no governmental oversight or regulation on consumer protection on people's data, you know, people have call, called Silicon Valley the stalker economy. There's this sort of like broader infrastructure and it's not even as simplistic as just like, oh, you don't want to just reinforce your political biases because that conversation I think gets really simplistic too. But just this idea that you are literally cocooning small groups and individuals as much as possible purely to target them products and make money off of them and then just create more information out of them to keep the process going. And I'm just wondering, like, as you research this and you saw like the context of the problem, did her frame there that like, oh, there's nothing wrong with the algorithms. It's just like the content. Did you start to call that into question a little bit maybe? Because it seems like if that's the only thing that we're using and there's no oversight, there's no regulation, there's no control, it, I don't see how it could not help but feed these kind of problems, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think there's different uh, degrees to which this works. I mean, it is in YouTube's interest to keep you online as long as possible. Um, and I think as you go into more extreme filter bubbles, it actually becomes more profitable for YouTube. Mm -hmm. If you look at conspiracy uh, communities, YouTubers will say, oh, don't look at other news sources because they're lying to you. Just stay on YouTube and watch more YouTube videos. And that's great for YouTube's economy. Um, so I don't think the same um, phenomena is exactly in effect with, uh, with makeup tutorials. But I mean, I think one problem we have is sort of a monopoly right now in terms of these vast uh, digital platforms. There's really no one competing with YouTube. And so everyone should have, you know, the consumer choice to 
watch, you know, make of videos or atheist videos if you'd like. But the problem is that all of those um, those choices we make are being funneled back through the same website, which is um, using it to learn about us, to probably calibrate the algorithm. So there is um there is a degree to which that's troubling. And in fact, I spoke to a YouTube. Um, one of the former employees who helped write that algorithm and who now sort of regrets elements of it. And he said that YouTube's problem isn't so much a content problem as it is an algorithm problem. No matter what, if you have a platform that large, there will be extremist content on it probably. But what we can do is to stop it recommending those videos so highly. So let's talk specifically about the pipelines and how they work now in terms of the content, less of the algorithms. Um, and this pipeline process, uh, and and specifically, I want to talk about these 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 characters that are like conduit characters, like Dave Rubin, as an example. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, I like him a lot more as a broadcaster. I get dinged for saying this, but Joe Rogan definitely serves a very similar role. He does a better show, uh, and but there's this sort of like people who at least are branded as being kind of like the broad general sort of middle of the road content. Like some people like with the uh, Rogan, some people jokingly call him like bro Oprah, uh, actually facilitating through their guest selection and they're sort of like who they're building like symbiotic relationships with, um, the sort of departure points to the more really far right content. One glaring example of this and i think people should really think about when you know uh, some academic like steve pinker who has all this brand prestige does a friendly sit down with uh, dave rubin dave rubin uh, had on you know the very fringe very dangerous extreme character stefan melanieu uh, and literally the name of the show i believe is race and iq or something like race and brain science uh, and he gave him a th you know several hour platform to uncritically promote um, racist IQ ideas. How does this process work in terms of like how these people build relationships with each other and how that sort of gradual facilitation to the greater extremism starts, but particularly through those conduits like Dave Rubin? Right. I think those conduits are running a really good scam and that they present themselves as neutral or even they'll say they're liberal, they're class liberal, which means next to nothing. Right. Um, but because it means they you're being disingenuous. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. But because they present themselves as these uh, just open platforms, and I think we have um, we have a really fundamental misunderstanding of how conversation and conversion works right now, where we seem to say, well, you know, if you just hear all sides, if you just have a debate, then the best idea will win. That's right. not how it works at all. Right. Um, but because we sort of start from that misinformed standpoint, people like Dave Rubin can present themselves as neutral and saying, well, I'm just, you know, hosting everyone and I'll let my very smart viewers figure it, figure it out. Well, no, I mean, in a, I think in a healthy information economy, you don't come across people who are pushing, you know, uh, bunk race science and stuff like that. And what's also interesting is you mentioned that Stefan Molyneux interview. I had to watch it once because I, um, I think I was like quoting it for something to, I think, point out that Stefan Molyneux has really problematic views. And ever since, for about six months, it has come up at the top of my recommendation feed in YouTube. So something in that algorithm is really, it's weighting that kind of video very highly. Um, and I think that's something that the supposedly neutral conduit should take into account when they when they host these people is that um, they are introducing this new quantity to an ostensibly neutral uh, viewership and it's going to stick around it's going to be really influential for people 100% so okay so this is and then how does that implicate like uh, you know even people who have prestige outside of YouTube that's why I mentioned Steve Pinker um, and or someone like Sam Harris, who, you know, in my mind, I mean, Sam Harris is definitely best understood as a podcast host, you know, YouTube pundit of this sort of, you know, weird, disingenuous right wing and, you know, kind of obsessed with IQ and Islam sort of milieu. Uh, but he also has established a certain degree of prestige off of the platform that someone like Dave Rubin does not have. And then, of course, you have someone like, 
you know, Barry Weiss writing these, you know, breathless and credulous pieces in the New York Times. And so that that kind of like broader branding effort uh, has been pushed out into a broader public. Like, what do you, what do you think, like, in terms of the the intellectual accountability for people like that so that like you know someone like steve pinker as an example should at least know or have it clearly registered like hey you know one of the prime platforms you went on on youtube to promote your book as a you know as a harvard professor and so on is a you know a credulous sort of promoter of of of, uh, of bigotry through various guests he has on other guests who seem to be almost like Sasha Baron Cohen level sort of like fraudulent characters on their face like and that would be a best case scenario because it'd be better if they didn't exist and they were actually literal jokes but and or Barry Weiss for that matter you know writing this piece in the New York Times like oh my god all of these actually pretty turgid old right-wing ideas rebranded for the YouTube age or somehow this you know incredibly brave culture and then that's actually the main conduit that they get out into an audience even offline. Yeah, I think it lends a real uh, veneer of credibility and intellectualism to a movement that um, is right now very largely based in YouTube. And personally, I like YouTube. I don't think sure. we should completely discredit it as, you know, uh, as a source of thought. But a lot of people do. Um, and, you know, we've seen this time and time throughout history, and uh, I'm going to do the terrible thing where I reference the Nazis, but I know a lot about them, is that, you know, they, one way that they were able to take this horrible ideology from, you know, just street thuggery and things that were floating around in fringe newspapers into the mainstream is just having a few intellectuals on their side. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily good writers. Barry Weiss isn't a good writer, but people nice. who could at least give them, you know, yeah. give them a, uh, the look of someone that you could take seriously. Um, and that, I think that's what these uh, intellectuals are doing consciously or not. I want to talk about uh, deplatforming and we might have a, you know, a difference of, op of opinion on this, but it's just been a conversation that's been floating. And I, I, I mean, for, first of all, actually, would you say that there's a difference um, that we can actually work out really sharply um between say as an example i i think i guess i'll put it to you really simply and i not only do i loathe sargon i actually did a debate with sargon which is one of the more sort of odd unpleasant experiences of my life mainly because i did have a bunch of really enraged uh i'm definitely assuming young virgins uh you know ranting at me for days online afterwards but that being said uh, what he got kicked off of Patreon for, which uh, we can get into in a second. And then someone like Laura Southern, who got kicked off of Patreon, uh, she, you know, had left any recognizable realm of speech. She was literally using that platform to get money to do some type of like grassroots flotilla effort to terrorize migrants, if I recall correctly. And that absolutely mm -hmm. steps into, you know, action. Right. Um, so. My concern about the deplatforming, though, goes back to this broader concern and critique of these tech companies, which is that, okay, there are these headlines that someone like Gavin McGinnis or Alex Jones have lost their platform. And in and of themselves, great. I don't care. I don't have some sort of romantic fixation about these people being able to say what they want to say, you know, and they can uh, in other ways, whatever. Screw them. Screw Sargon, too. Now, that said, I don't trust private platforms um, who I don't think should have, frankly, this amount of power to begin with over our public discourse in an unaccountable way to be the arbiters uh, in an intelligent way of who should and shouldn't uh, speak. So in Facebook, as an example, the headlines are they got rid of Alex Jones and Gavin McGinnis. Sure, great, whatever. Uh, but the greater structural um, excluding of voices is hitting news services like Telesaur as an example, uh, which, you know, one can think what they want of Telesaur, but Telesaur is a, ver is a very, you know, is a real, credible, certainly left-leaning, but important news source in Latin America. 
and Facebook is, you know, working with, you know, center right think tanks in Washington, D.C. to create uh, standards of what should and shouldn't uh, be posted. And so my concern about deplatforming more broadly is that instead of having a conversation about how to like potentially nationalize companies that need to be nationalized or strongly robustly regulate them uh, so that there can be serious public oversight over these companies or these companies having on ombudsmen that can actually like s recognize that these companies are journalistic platforms, frankly, uh, it's going to be left to companies that hold a huge amount of power over the public discourse, don't have any commitment to the public good. In fact, as witnessed by your great reporting on how they have helped facilitate this horrific far right machine on YouTube. Uh, and they will sort of push and pull between various types of public sentiments, which will sure get rid of some awful people but also implicate a much broader ability for people to do anything critical or rigorous or adversarial so that instead of fig worrying about deplatforming people we need to worry about the types of structural reforms that can make these platforms actually accountable and non-monopolistic does that make any sense mm -hmm. yeah it does make sense and yeah. i think there's two main concerns i think as we talk about the really far right, and you brought up a great example of uh, Lauren Southern yes. crowdfunding for, for uh, boats in the Mediterranean that would harass migrants. Got to go. Um, Different yeah. thing. <laughs> yes. Yep. And so when we talk about that, activists talk about, you know, uh, immediate, in preventing harm in the immediate sense. Um, and in that, in that case, deplatforming, it, it works. We've seen that when people get kicked off platforms, they lose audience. Um, right now, the whole far right is looking for an alternative to Patreon. They're not really finding it yet. So as we've seen so far, it works. Um, and depending on your standpoint, um, whether you think it, that is the prerogative um, of just you know trying to reduce immediate harm, that's the standpoint some people have. But I think you're really right to bring up the, um, the idea of monopoly in these tech companies. And they do not have our public interest at, at heart. Um, so I think when we talk about deplatforming, we do need to talk about having some broader oversight. And there's different ways you can approach that. One is the idea of nationalization, um, having a large overseeing body, one that hopefully has, you know, some ideological diversity that has, you know, public accountability that isn't locked away in a boardroom that we don't know who's discussing what and who has what financial aims. But there's also the idea of breaking up the uh, monopoly. Right now, Facebook, I mean, forget Facebook being the largest social network. It's what you log into everything with. It's, it, has its, uh, yep. it has its tendrils everywhere. So I think right now as people try and distance themselves from these platforms, we're realizing how few alternatives we have. And I think in the immediate sense, maybe it would be worthwhile coming up with more social networks and maybe those individual ones that could have, um, that could have their standards. I think maybe we give large platforms too much credit and say, well, you know, if you ban this one person, it's a slippery slope. I'm kind of a moral purist and I say they should be able to recognize, you know, who's a Nazi and I don't want them on my, I don't want them personally on my uh, page. So maybe that is the work of uh, alternative social networks in the future. Yeah. I mean, I think for what, it, I mean, there's a part of, right. Like great bring on the left wing Patreon and I won't share audience with the, uh, you know, share platform with, you know, Dave Rubin. Sounds good to me. Uh, but uh, my, my my last question, I guess, is is also is is also fairly broad. I'm curious your thoughts on this too, obviously. Which is part of what sucks and is so disheartening about this is it definitely means that, and I think this is again this is one of these weird like even just difference between being like in your 30s versus your 20s, right? Which is like just a sense that if you grew up at a certain time that it wasn't that we didn't have a really broad public debate um, and there weren't a lot of things on the table, uh, but that there were certain things that really were closed. And I don't mean closed like in the, you know, easy examples that these guys can jump in on like, you know, Oh, here's an example of a college student being ridiculous about a joke or something. I'm not talking about that, but that there were real things that we had 
agreed both empirically, like the Holocaust happened, and also like morally, right? Like civil rights as an example. And it doesn't mean that in any way there wasn't a massive amount like this, you know, profound racism, misogyny, anti-Semitism, and ahistorosity, all of that, of course. But it's it, it's it's sort of, I guess what it is, is it's had enough success where they've put certain questions back into play. And I feel like part of the impulse that people like us have is like, no, we're not going to relitigate this. Like, you know, people have literally died for these things. But they might have done enough as an example that like, like I needed to do uh, IQ content a while ago because they put it enough on the table that you needed to respond to it because they were able to exploit like, see, we're having a quote unquote rational conversation. All the left has is moral condemnation. Where do you think the line is between holding the line that no, we've, you know, these, some things are and should be settled questions versus, you know, taking up battles that we might have already thought we've won, but realizing that have, first of all, weren't really won to begin with and then have been reopened in a different way by these pernicious people. Yeah, I think one reason we're seeing this reopen um, is kind of because of tech companies. Yep. Um, and I think right now, due to filter bubbles, due to these uh, sort of opt-in communities, people can sort of choose their own reality. So ideas that, listen, a normal person has to choose their morals and their set of facts. Um, and for any kind of mental stability, those things can't always be in flux. And I think that's good. You know, there are certain established facts. I wrote about the flat earth community recently, and I'm not going to have a debate with them over whether the earth is flat. It's not. Um, so you do have to draw the line somewhere. Um, I think one issue, though, with, um, with our social media environment is that you can go so far down these rabbit holes, you know, sometimes led by algorithm uh, or just by, you know, curiosity, that your set of empirical facts start to change. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think this idea, oh, you know, we're just, we're bringing it into debate. We've seen that these, that presenting things as a debate with two sides is not always fair. It's not always objective in these two sides don't need to be in debate and Holocaust denial is a great example of something that objectively happened and that even having the debate is dangerous. It, you know, it loosens this, uh, I think our sense of social responsibility and it really enables people with hateful ideologies to move it a bit further. Um, so you talk about like where to draw the line. I think everyone should be educated, but, I think we need to understand that this shifting line isn't the line of objective facts. It's the place that these communities are leading us deliberately. And it's not going to stop just at that line. It's going to move. If you go to meet it, it's going to move on to the next and most extreme idea. Kelly Weil, I really appreciate your time. The piece is inside YouTube's far right radicalization factory. Read it at the Daily Beast. Kelly, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. All right, folks, we are going to go to the fun half. Before we do that, become a member of the Majority Report today, majority.fm slash become a member. And uh, you get the Just Coffee deal. Subscribe if you haven't yet on, on YouTube and uh, and on iTunes. Uh, what are we doing tomorrow? We're, I know we're doing a show, but do we know what we have in store for tomorrow? You know, just the end of the year wrap end up. End of the year last, wrap up. Last well, show of 2018. Last show, live show of 2018. And I know on Monday, it was actually, it was very fun. I was not, but uh, Alex Perrine and Sam were sipping some scotch. And the three of us, along with Matt dropping in from time to time, did a very fun year-round uh, year roundup, which is going to play on Monday. Um, tonight. The last show of the Michael Brooks show of 2018. Big Was, Will Sneel on Bray's in studio. We are going to have an incredibly fun time, as you would imagine. We're going to play a clip of this in the uh, fun half. I, <laughs> speaking of like algorithms, like, okay, everything that we cover, whether it's on this show or my show, is 
even if it's on the just, you know, Trump is a jackass side of the equation or here's Dave Rubin just acting like a complete, total, breathtaking moron. Oh, uh, no, I got I got trapped in an algorithm and sent to Brazil. I knew I got trapped in an algorithm and sent to Brazil. Actually, yeah, let's play that in a second because that fits nicely. Um, but, you know, you they all matter. It matters to, you know, uh, dunk on Dave Rubin to some degree. Uh, to sometimes to a significant degree, but you do have these moments and it's like, I get it. I understand like eating your vegetables, but like basically we did an exclusive interview with Lula's lawyer and more people need to watch that because <laughs> that's like a really big deal. Um, yeah, this and, is just honeypot yeah, stuff. Yeah. I mean this stuff like, cause I mean guys, like if you, we'll get to it more in, in the, in the fun half, but it isn't just obviously enormous personal admiration for the guy but this is a case study and an opening not only for the destruction of brazil but it actually has pretty far reaching consequences for how we think of uh, lawfare for u.s foreign policy and even for like the prospects of the types of politics you're interested in to some degree if you're watching this show most likely so uh Go on the Michael Brooks Show YouTube channel and watch the interview with Valeska Martins and share it uh, because it's could not be of more importance uh, and it matters. We are, in fact, literally global citizens. Uh, there are still tickets left, though they're picking up again for the Michael Brooks Show uh, at live show at the Bell House February 1st at, in Brooklyn. We'll talk about that more later. Get your tickets. Subscribe to the Michael Brooks Show on Patreon, patreon.com slash TMBS. Also, at 6 o'clock, I should have said this before, a little past 7, the regular full show, Waz is going to be in. At 6, we're doing a live stream uh, with uh, Jean Bajlan, Kurdish academic, on the situation in Rojava in light of this pullout. All right, uh, Matt. Uh, my Ann Bradstreet. Also, we talk about Ann Hutchinson. I don't know if you guys are f very familiar with Ann I know Hutchinson. the name, but I don't know anything. That's interesting to me because she's sort of a um, Massachusetts Bay. She was an early um, freedom of conscious person. She oh, was okay. sort of like, she came over uh, basically to follow Tom Cotton, John Cotton. Not to, I always make that mistake. To follow she John was not Cotton, following Tom Cotton. A preacher. She was not following the guy who looks like he has scurvy and advocates for war. And she was like, a, she was very like well read about the Bible and stuff. And then uh, shortly she started doing her own Bible studies. Uh, and the men and a whole bunch of people, men and women, would go to her house for these like, uh, I I compare them to like Talking Dead, like sort of uh, commentaries on the sermons. That's um, really interesting. And then the men were like, "We need to shut this down." Um, but anyway, that was the that's, that's the fascinating. Yeah, that's I the wonder if that had an indirect influence on the transcendentalists. Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, they, uh, uh I think they, they, a lot of them talk about her, but. That was the context for Anne Bradstreet writing her poetry, uh, and she was very concerned about uh, not being uh, hunted like a witch because that was basically a witch hunt. Uh, and later, those would be literal witch hunts. But Anne Hutchinson was sort of a—I mean, because it was about spiritual things too. And she, people talked, well, maybe that she thought that God convinced her to come to America, and then after things went poor, uh, she got exiled to Rhode Island, and uh, and uh, she had a. <laughs> This is how the Puritans were. Like she had a deformed child, and they're like, "Well, see, it was Satan that convinced you to come to America, and right. this is the, the proof of that." So, yeah, pretty crazy stuff in the colonial era. That's literary available. Hangover. That's available for members. It's going to be unlocked for everybody on Saturday. Get your literary hangover. Let's do this in the fun half. In the first half, actually, let's do this because I had set it up. Uh, you know, I I get afraid sometimes that for all the time we spend talking about how stupid Dave Rubin is, we don't talk about what an asshole he also is. Um, also a very genuinely bad person. And, you know, the hustle in the United States is, you know, the, the far right or the new centrists, the far right or the new libertines and so on. And that isn't true, obviously, first of all, as evidenced by the fact that they aren't across the board ardent free speech advocates in the old ACLU model, which I have a lot of respect for. It's evident in the fact that they never talk about any serious policy issues. It's all just sort of circle jerks about Twitter controversies and other relatively inconsequential things. Uh, and it's glaringly evident when, as an example, Dave Rubin, you know, 
planning apparently on voting for Donald Trump for president. That should sort of show the store. But this is another level here. This is actually incredible. This is Dave Rubin appearing on the pro Bolsonaro YT channel in Brasilia, uh, Brasilia Parallelo. And just to be clear, J.R. Bolsonaro, in addition to promising savage austerity, pension cuts, labor cuts, uh, abuses of the poor and vulnerable of Brazil and carrying out the interests of Western corporate interests, which obviously there's no controversy about that. We've all seen Dave talk about Amazon. Um, you know, the, the Koch brothers are plugged into, you know, the sort of air vacuums in his head about these things. But he has said a lot that, you know, I mean, never gets tired of mentioning as a gay man and never gets mentioned, you know, tired of, of, of saying that he, you know, opposes identity politics. Well, uh, Bolsonaro has talked about beating his kid if he was gay. Uh, his sons uh, and people affiliated with him have celebrated the assassination of Marielle Franco, who was a lesbian uh, city councilwoman. And this is a government that is not only neo-fascist, uh, incoming neo-fascist government, it's in no way hiding the ball on its plans for uh, a ruthless, vicious social agenda, including increasing police violence. So it's a good example, though, of the reciprocity of media because these people are going to take on the latest trends of the extreme right in the United States. That's why you have a cabinet ministers in the Bolsonaro government who talk about cultural Marxism, the old John Birch Society conspiracy theory, which has been recycled into Jordan Peterson. And now here's Dave Rubin, the classical liberal, helping spread propaganda for a regime that is literally promising to ban protests, which I might, some might consider a form of free speech, and is celebrated mass killings. We have a very similar problem that you guys have in Brazil. I mean, the media has basically lost all credibility. Uh, the line that I like to say is that many, if not most journalists, they're not journalists anymore, they're activists. Já não restam dúvidas de que aqueles em posição de nos orientar no mundo so, abandonaram a sua missão. They're coming back. There's going to be more of this idiot. Aqueles que concentram o poder sobre o povo, os fatos viraram meias verdades. That's not news. What what is news really is what's really happening in culture. What are people really thinking about? A mídia tradicional está com os dias contados. I love how like even when you're trying to do like a serious actually this is a really bad guy clip, which Dave Rubin is an incredibly bad, disgusting, morally vacant person. He's just so stupid that it's hard not to laugh. But I uh, no, I can't take any more. If you have any even cursory knowledge of modern Brazil, you know that the entire of mainstream Brazilian media, including state media, was ruthlessly opposed to Dilma Rousseff and Lula da Silva and have spread every matter of rumor and innuendo about the Workers' Party covered Bolsonaro with kid gloves. The Wall Street Journal endorsed him. The Brazilian mainstream press either endorsed him or treated him with kid gloves. And they all supported a extrajudicial coup that removed Dilma. That actually, in his dim-witted way, I mean, he's that's that's just a big lie. That is, that is actually literally fascistic big lie. Ooh. That isn't even like, oh, that's wrong on the merits because you have to consider this news source. It's like, yeah. no, the Brazilian media was uniformly and ruthlessly committed to destroying democratically elected governments of Dilma and Lula. And in the last couple of weeks of the runoff, they may have, run, or before the runoff, because by the time the runoff happened, they consolidated behind the fascist Bolsonaro, they may have ran a few pieces being like, hey, this Bolsonaro guy, 
um, when he said that, like, you know, uh, Afro-Brazilians are inferior or people around him talked about killing gay people or the plans to hand guns to everybody so they can kill people or the proposals that police should be able to shoot people in favelas without le any legal consequences. Um, maybe that's a little bit. And, oh, this story of uh, somebody from uh, a supporter of his carving a swat sticker into a teenage girl's stomach. We should look into that. Or even uh, what happened uh, last or uh, two weeks ago, which was two members of the landless movement literally being gunned down at a camp. Um, those things, and that wasn't covered in mainstream Brazilian media at all. So Dave Rubin, dishonest, horrible person. I'm sure he's too stupid to know and doesn't care. How am I supposed to know what's going on in Brazil? I just want to know <laughs> yeah. the ideas that they're I just they're want to know the about. ideas. I mean, they were saying that the ideas, that, that uh, there was a lot of ideas going on, and that Bolsonaro was interested in ideas. Bolsonaro has, um, one of Bolsonaro's main uh, advisors, and I'm going to be looking into this more, is uh, a Brazilian who lives in exile, who writes in Virginia, and uh, believes that cultural Marxism is destroying the planet, and is a former astrologer. Uh, and he is one of the main intellectual architects and ideas man. Along with, of course, uh, Pinochet advising Milton Friedman style Wall Street advisors who are going to ram through destroying labor protections. And I've, I'm sure, of course, Dave Rubin doesn't know any of that, but he doesn't care to know. Sounds very interesting to yeah. me, though. Whoa, oh, whoa, whoa. Astrology. Astrology. Whoa. Oh, boy. Astrology and hard right politics. Astrology I, and hard right politics. My ears are burning. My ears are burning. Wow. I'll give you a little tutorial on how to. Uh, Suck money out of insecure weird men on uh, the internet. Disgusting. These people are disgusting, loathsome. Fascist propagandists. Fascist propagandists. They're disgusting, grotesque, loathsome people. We'll see you on the fun half. You are in for it. All right, folks. 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Are you ready? Alpha males are back, 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 boy, back, and the alpha males are back, back, just as delicious as you can imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boy, back, and the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back. Almost says what? The alpha males of back, 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 back. You are a madman! And the alpha males of back, back, back. I, I, I am a total cunt. Can we bring back DJ Danner song, please? Yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Danner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough of a break. That's fucking nonsense. Hey, folks! Fucking reminder! I do not have Parkinson's. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Almost says what? 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 Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. The alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black. Out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on! Fuck them. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday! My birthday! Happy birthday to me, Jew boy! I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back, back. Africans are black, black. Alpha males are back, back. Africans are black. Pay the price.
guys are blasphemy around here. I, 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 I am a total pussy. Pussy, 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 pussy. Welcome. Welcome to the fun half. We were just uh, saying that if Dave Rubin <laughs> was actually what he claimed he was, which was just this sort of like, you know, as sort of vacant, but really just genuinely curious about everything. And he just had on like every, like he had Farrakhan on his. It's like commodity fetishism, but for ideas. But Rubin's always is just right wing ideas. No, I mean, Rubin's a fascism conduit. But if it was just like, or I guess even with, or he just. Every variety of reactionary idea imaginable. Yeah, neo confederate, <laughs> market fundamentalist, market fundamentalist. Just love ideas, all the ideas. ideas. All the ideas. But he had Farrakhan on. It's like, so, so you're saying that people like Malcolm X, but he really wasn't that great. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the question, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> like, so, um, uh, who, would it be, who would it be? I can't even. Uh, Malcolm X is he? Why is he holding that gun? It's it's like he doesn't want his neighbor to come over and have a free exchange of ideas <laughs> yeah, with him. Yeah. So what what was happening was that you were uh, you were trying to get over to Malcolm's house, so um, uh, you can engage him with ideas. But then he uh, he held the gun. Is that true, Lewis? Um, you know what I mean? Because I mean that, that's the problem with news days that people aren't interested in ideas. All right, let's take a call out of the gate. You are calling from an 847 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hey, Michael. It's Josh from Chicago. What's up, Josh? How are you doing, man? I'm doing okay. I'm calling from Chicago, by the way, today. Oh, nice. Just want everyone to know that. So it's, so it's real. Uh, so it's real. It's real. What's on your mind, my friend? It's real. <laughs> Sweetheart, grab me a beer. <laughs> Sweetheart, grab me a beer. All right, what's on your mind, my friend? Uh, so uh, I love calling in because we don't have the, the third way centrist uh, MSNBC guy. Uh, so we could talk about real socialists like uh, Jeremy Corbyn. Mini MSNBC. So, uh, yeah. Mini MSNBC. That boy. So um, our boy. Yep. The boy. The ultimate boy. The ultimate boy. Um, so I, I think... Uh, you you talked about how you agreed with his strategy of not calling for um, a, a new referendum, and I, mm -hmm. I sort of agree with that. Um, I am curious, though. I think they will force. I I if I were to predict, I would say in the new year there's going to be an, another general election. I think so. Yeah. Um, oh, def I think that that's pretty so, hard to imagine there won't be. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just I and I would guess it would be against i think reese moog would be the person who he would face oh my god because uh that would yes be, jesus christ <laughs> there's as there's as good a verse evil contest as you're gonna get or just like a like social <laughs> democrat is, ve vegetarian versus like some type of like weird like inbred freak of the modern it's like age both sides caricatures are going to be running yeah Alien. both side characters are going to be running I don't want to harm animals. That's why I contemplated fruitarianism. <laughs> like, I when we went Tony Blair got rid of fox hunting, that was the most despicable act. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Mother would have uh. father, who was also my brother, and then we would go hunt the poor in the village green. <laughs> yeah, Je Mog is a freak. All right, what is your question? He's a, he's. I guess my question is, I think, and I don't know if you agree, I think he needs to call a, a second referendum after he gets into power. Um, because I don't think he's going to get a better... The problem with the, the Brexit thing is this is the only deal that they will get. The EU will not cut them a better deal. Yep. Um, yep. I, I think mean, you're I think right. that's the feeling I get. And I think, I don't know if you agree, I think he needs to call for the second re referendum. And I don't think that will hurt him. Like, I don't... I don't think I so think either. Part of the I don't think so. I think you're right. I mean, I, I think that, yeah. I, it's very hard because, look, Jeremy Corbyn obviously comes out of a left tradition that critiques the EU. And the EU, if you just broke it really simply into two different buckets, would be a macroeconomic policy and the rules of the euro and how that currency is designed and the austerity and the 
just the vicious punishment of Greece as an example that it's led to. And mm -hmm. uh, the economic policy is really bad. And it does contradict not a sort of modest social democracy, but certainly a more robust, fully healthy, democratic, and more realized society, which I, which Corbyn and McDonald are trying to push towards. On the other hand, then there's obviously all of, um, you know, the sort of social Europe and some, you know, some really great things like open borders, like some step in how the NHS is funded, the, how the NHS, well, the Which NHS is, is funded partially. I mean, that's just because of the, you know, that's just the economic activity that goes into uh, yeah. into Europe, into the UK through Europe, which is maybe a third. But also the people who work in it. Sure. The a people, lot of European people. Definitely. Okay. A lot of European, a lot of European people in the NHS, for sure. And and good environmental policies and so on and so forth. So I think the reality is, is and part of, and, you know, that's the tricky thing with Jeremy Corbyn, right? Like Jeremy Corbyn is an amazing leader for our time and has this fierce ethics and is right about most of the major issues of the day because he held his ground on any number of things, whether it was solidarity with the Kurds or, you know, economic democracy during a time when those, uh, you know, when the left was in complete retreat. And then on the other hand, I think that mm -hmm. maybe at times there's some adaptability that he's not on as much as I would want him to be. And the way this Brexit is designed and the way that vote took place can only have a right wing and disastrous outcome as I see it. So I do think he should call for a second referendum, but I don't think he should expand political capital uh, to benefit. Not while he's not. No, power. no, because that's saving Theresa May. And that's the agenda of these Blairites who are still trying to destroy him. So I do not think that he he should get into office. That is his number one priority. That's how that's yeah. my read. I, Once he's in office, yeah, I, I agree if, with you. I think if they could stop Brexit, that clearly would on balance, especially for the UK. The UK actually had the best arrangement with oh, the yeah. EU you can imagine. They didn't have their currency. They weren't on the EU. They got to take all of the advantages of a shared market um, and obviously all of the structural inequalities and issues of capitalism they want to deal with that were cynically manipulated by the Brexiteers. So, yes, I agree with you, but not before he's elected. No, not before he's elected. I think he could run on it, like if in the general election, he could run and say, hey, labor, especially if he's facing Reese Mogg, Reese Mogg will, will run on whatever the opposite is of a second referendum. So I think that right. would differentiate him. Um, well, I think they don't I, need that much differentiation. <laughs> I think that's, oh, uh, yeah. yeah, that's, yeah. but no, I, I think I, I'm, I'm inclined to think your way on it. Uh, thanks for the call, man. Yep. Appreciate it. Colin from Nebraska, Michael, you need to learn how to do JP's cough, sneeze, whatever the fuck that sound is. Yeah, he does do it. Doesn't he have it? He has like a, it's a Patreon, uh, dog whistling. <laughs> it's a very interesting thing. Jesus Christ, these people are fucking amazing. Attorney Andrew, two Dem House members introduced CAP's alternative to Medicare for All yesterday entitled Medicare for America. The bill keeps employer insurance in place while transitioning people to their employer's insurance onto an enhanced Medicare program. However, under this enhanced Medicare program, people will pay premiums up to 9.3% of their income, have a deductible of around... 3500 to 5000 and the bill and will have to pay copays private insurers would exist for employers because it's a cap because it's caps basic selling point is that this bill can pass whereas the Sanders bill cannot there isn't really an argument to why it will really produce a better policy outcome i for one welcome Topher Spiro the dragon to be the ugly friends of medicare for all uh, keep it around makes it look uh, keeping it around makes it look even better. I, yeah, I agree. And I, for what it's worth, like, I don't, I don't, there's no popular momentum. Like that's it. It's a very old model to say, it's like, first of all, okay. In reality world, what, what is stunning about that thought process? When you put out a policy like that and you say it has the best chance of, of, uh, passing you, the thought it, you're completely disconnected from the actual Washington politics that you're trying to address and deal with. 
and you have no commitment uh, connection to the grassroots and the energy of the country. So no Republicans are going to co-sign that. And it is going to be a monumental uphill battle uh, to pass anything to do with radically expanding health care while Republicans are in any type of position to block it, no matter what it is. They only, even almost killed Obamacare, which was literally their 1990s plan. <laughs> right? And then on the other hand, the only thing that you're going to get people out into the streets for pressuring their Congress people, the plan that the most popular and exciting and dynamic politicians in America, whether it's AOC or Bernie Sanders or, you know, Elizabeth Warren, they're on board with Medicare for all or Kamala Harris or Cory Booker. Look, these people are all on record is Medicare for all. So it's just delusional because they're giving like an argument that's like, well, you know, when you really sit down, you actually think about what we're actually going to pass here. You're not going to pass a goddamn thing. <laughs> There's no bipartisan health care bill. It's getting passed. Delusional, nuts, totally disconnected from reality of today's politics. And then because it has all these crappy provisions and because it doesn't do the job of just finally giving everybody full, complete public health insurance like every other industrialized country in the world and getting rid of these useless, inefficient predator companies, you're never going to have. You think you're going to get a whole bunch of young activists who've been <laughs> pounding the pavement for Justice Democrats and DSA and you know this whole new energy? For that, no, it's Cra delusional. It's, it's just shockingly delusional, actually. It's disturbing how delusional it Crap is. Crappier Medicare for people who can go through the hoops. Right. Fist up. It's just, just shocking. Um, it's the best they got with all that money. It's the best they got with all that money. Uh, <laughs> remember how I said how Brian Kilmeade occasionally like he has these sort of like woke takes where he points something out. That's like really obviously racist, but then he's also like this, he hasn't quite gotten the memo that like they aren't in the Bush era anymore. And they're supposed to be more like sort of like tips of the hat to the kind of like isolationist thing. So he's still really on this. Like it's, it's terrorism. Like we got to be killing and bombing everybody, you know, like, I think, I guess he does fancy himself some type of expert on Islam or something. And he, clearly, he wrote a book on Thomas Jefferson oh, and the Barbary Pirates, so yeah. I think he's a pretty big expert. I'm sure he wrote that book. And, um, you know, so and clearly this stuff gives him anxiety. And uh, this pull out of Syria, as I say, there is the real complexity of the Rojava Kurds and some of the humanitarian consequences that will happen. But there's also the reality that we've been there for no strategic purpose, killing thousands of people as active co-participants in the destruction of a country in a multiplayer proxy war that has just devastated Syria. And we, with the Gulf, Russia, and Iran, and everyone are responsible for this, as well as these Salafist groups, and certainly as well as Assad. I'm guessing that Brian Kilmeade is not going to bring any of this up in this clip. This is according to our friends, the Kurds. Everyone is upset, sure. sad, and afraid. Most who spoke to Fox News afraid to using their names. The Kurds did the fighting. We did the backing. We did the strategizing. Now, when we try to go back in there and reestablish ourselves, mm -hmm. the big difference is the Russians. Because but President Obama sat on his hands. The Russians mm -hmm. came in and filled the void. We established that area, started protecting the Kurds, re uh, pushing back on ISIS, and now we pull back. They come back. They're right. not gone. But you're They're assuming dispersed. that we're handing 30, Syria to Iran without right. noting as well that this president stood up to Iran and, and pulled when? out of the nuclear deal. When? Well, but, out of the nuclear so deal. What president message, Obama so was handing them cash. Is that message. a better idea? Let's Mi hand Iran no, cash. We're oh doing the same God. thing. We, we're, we're we, might have, we, might have, we are allowing them to reestablish themselves in a region. The counterbalance that this president has provided is dissipated. But when and, he... the, and the Al Qaeda <laughs> threat is reforming. Anyone who tells you different will be sitting on this couch in a year talking about the reformation of ISIS and the uh, brutal uh, decimation of that region but and our allies when in he the made, area. When he articulated those points, though, about not staying there forever and about bringing those troops home, those were points that were very popular with the American who people. Who cares so about 
popular. Well, it's about no, something <laughs> you have to say. Because people feel like these things have no yeah. end, and that's the idea. And if you're gonna have pe if you're gonna have troops stationed there, they want to know a long term goal. They want to know what the objective is. They, they want to plan. Because it's our the, men and women out there. They got the objective: right. destroy the Caliphate and make sure <laughs> Iran has blood, which could well, potentially go on forever. As you can that's see, the a fear. lot of people fired up about this. What do you think, friends? Totally FoxNews.com. We'll be talking about it all morning. <laughs> <laughs> Man, kill me. It's so angry. I love it. <laughs> Here's the thing. Okay. First part, I'm not going to lie. With regards to those quotes from the Kurds, that is true. It's 100% right. I I am incredibly worried about the Rojava Kurds. Incredibly worried. Now, obviously, the United States was never supporting them because they care about Kurdish rights or the experiment going on there. Obviously not. The record of the United States would demonstrate that for <laughs> ever but i mean okay and then we run down the list and you know al-qaeda is going to reformulate itself and all this stuff and all this nonsense that you know there was no need there was no, there's no national security threat in any real way that's posed by these activities to begin with and dealing with terrorist groups require small ter uh, targeted intelligence operations and nothing like these catastrophic wars that have caused such unending damage and death and just I mean, literally, cumulatively, the killing of millions of innocent people by U.S. foreign policy. Uh, but the the meta critique on this, though, it's like I think part of the reason that even though Kilmeade is like you know a delusional militaristic dunce, at least in his emotionality, he's sort of like registering that this is like an actual thing. Now he's almost entirely wrong, but these other people would be saying. Precisely the opposite while Obama was president and promoting the opposite when and I think in Ed Henry's case it did when Bush was president. So there is just something so disgusting and a reminder that like these are all just like blow dried idiots in Midtown who don't know what the fuck they're talking mm -hmm. about. They don't care how many people the United States has killed in these places. They don't care about the complex interplay between the Kurds and, and all these other groups. And incidentally, the people that are going to destroy the Kurds are not Iran, you moron, Kilmeade. It's our good ally, Turkey, that we just sold over $3 billion worth of new weaponry to. They're going to go after the Kurds. And, you know, it, it, so anyways, it it's embarrassing. It's pathetic. Uh, but uh, Kilmeade continue if this goes in enough uh if this keeps going i could see kill me being like a sort of like second term obama voter like hey that's a really problematic comment and we need to have drones in somalia because of the uh, uh, al-qaeda hawks for obama hawks for obama that was a real thing man yeah okay this is the this is now kill me yeah okay this is actually kind of extraordinary because one of the things okay a little bit of context. First of all, Obama was not gung ho to get into Syria at all. He allowed himself to get pulled into Syria more and more, and it was accelerated actually through ISIS, not through Assad. So, what you basically had in the beginning was the administration just sort of letting the CIA subcontract with Gulf countries. They flooded the place with weapons, and a lot of those weapons and groups go to who the Gulf countries usually support, which are far right Sunni Salafist groups who gradually undermined and took over what was absolutely an organic, legitimate, and real uprising against the brutality of the Assad regime. Uh, and then Obama said, if he uses chemical weapons, there'll be a red line, and then we got to get in. And then what ended up happening was that there was a deal that was cut with the Russians, and they didn't do it. Also because there was massive protests because of war fatigue in the United States and the UK. Correct war fatigue. And everybody seems to have gotten the wrong lesson from this. People who still want to deny that the Assad government has those weapons and might have used them will bend in pretzels to deny that that's ever happened, even though I'm sure it's certainly happened, at least in some instances. It's totally belied by the fact that the Russians, who are Assad's prime patron, cut a deal to destroy stockpiles. What does that tell you about their stockpiles? Use a little bit of deductive reasoning here. And then conversely... All of the right-wing hawks and idiots were freaked out because Obama promised a red line, and he promised a red line. Now he needs to bomb Syria because of our credibility and all these other masturbatory concepts. Who that, lost China? Yeah, all of this nonsense that if you have no real-world experience, you don't understand how the world actually works, and you think you're in a Tom Clancy novel from your you know couch somewhere or, God forbid, at a think tank, 
you get lost in. But actually, he did deal with the red line being crossed, which is they cut a diplomatic agreement, which actually worked and held for a little while uh, and was a correct use of diplomacy. But here is the red line is going to be brought up. And Kilmeade, again, is going to be, well, this is just funny. Everybody's wrong here, but it's funny. Back on ISIS. But why are and you surprised? You both, but the if president you, said this in the campaign. Stunning. He, did, because why, why why defend, defend, he said we're bringing the, the boys does, home. Oh, he wants yes. to bring, he wants he, to. He could be wrong, but he promised the American people he was going to do He is doing it. exactly, if not worse, than President Obama did. The, this is worse than blurring the red line. The, the, the other wing of the Republican Party, the Mike Lees, the Rand Pauls, wow, the Libertarian wing of the party have come out and said, listen, you can't, you, what, the, the, the well, point that Ed is articulating that you can't stay there forever wow. are, are, wow. are accurate to some. Wow. And also the notion that, to yes, hope. during the campaign, to I hope. have to tell you, I have a libertarian streak in my blood a little bit. And when he talked about yeah. not blood. wanting to be the policeman of the world, that did appeal to a lot right. of people. You have to remember, too, Trump is looking forward to re-election. And he's saying, he's so you know pissed. what? I don't only need the base, but I need some of these people well, in the middle. Well, let me ask you, Jedediah, what good is re-election if you go ahead and give Syria to Iran, lose <laughs> Iraq again? <laughs> so wow, angry. Rand Paul. Wow. Yeah. Another thing, another sentiment I've shared with Kilmeade for completely different reasons. I've had that moment though, where someone's like, "Well, I don't know, Rand Paul wants to legalize pot." And I was like, <sighs> "Whoa, Rand Paul, the, fuck you!" The belligerents of him. I, oh, it's great. He's like, but that's what's, but it's so sincere. When you're yes, I like, exactly. I like the way like his face is red. He's rolling his eyes. It's great. When you're the only one being um, genuine. Uh, and not trying to spin, you can be belligerent. Right. And you can still be yeah. winning for people. That's no. I mean, look, he's he's almost entirely Trump wrong, almost. and he's insanely militaristic and delusional. But like, again, these two, these the other two are just voids. Yeah. If they had another script, they would say exactly what he was saying. Like, if Jeb Bush was president, and that was like, they would be delivering Kilmeade's script. Except it wouldn't even be being delivered because there wouldn't even be this this draw out, right? But kill me, to, yeah. I mean, that's that's hysterical. It's amazing what he's willing to jeopardize his like TV friendship with Trump over, though. <laughs> that yeah. I will say, yeah. <laughs> that also says a lot about him. Like, oh, he'd be little nuanced about Charlottesville, but not bombing Syria forever. Um. Marxist Republican, ever since Mike Racine, your guys' Rubens have gotten so much better. One of my faves now. Yeah, well, he got the... You need to just crack him. And I think his, like, South Park Canadian... And, and we're still perfecting, because Michael and I were talking about it. That, that It's good, and people can recognize it, but Ruben has a bit more of, like, California dirtbag to him or something. Yeah, it's the only or, like, part West that's Coast. missing is that Ruben is, like, a really genuinely awful human being. And it needs to... That, that kind of just, like, hey, I'm just an idiot. Is a little too likable. Yeah. Um, but it's it's getting a lot of it. Uh, Dunce Oligarch. Hey, Mike, it's my birthday. How about a Jew horn? Happy birthday. All right, let's take a call. You're calling from a 713 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hello. Uh, my name is Michael. Hi, Michael. What's on your mind? Hi. Hi, so Sam talked earlier this week about, I'm from Texas, so he talked about the kind of Texas school, how the Texas textbooks and their curriculums are uh, are a mess and kind of how they influence uh, the country. And I've kind of thought of it in a different way that a lot of people have done it. I, I remember, I've noticed that one thing is that we don't talk about like the English curriculum as much. We talk about the history curriculum. And one okay. thing I've noticed is, in my case, I remember in high school reading Ayn Rand in the Jesus curriculum. Jesus Christ, and, dude. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm not just saying it was a book assigned by a teacher. I remember the Ayn Rand Institute uh, sponsoring scholarships being promoted in the school. And I'm wondering if there's been any looking into the extent that that organization has influenced like the English curriculum in school, schools in like red states. Because I think that's like if you're in formative years, you're learning politics for the first time. The first real political book you're reading is like anarcho-capitalist propaganda. I think that's troubling, and I think uh, more people should look into the influence that organization has in education. To say the least, I don't know anything about it, but that's um, I mean, that's disturbing, and it's a great point. I I don't know if it's Jane yeah. Mayer's 
uh, um, I don't know if it's Jane Mayer's Dark Money or if it's a different, uh, mm-hmm. different writer, but I know for a fact that a lot of these those right wing foundations in the sixties, seventies, and eighties were literally buying Ayn Rand books in bulk and giving them to university libraries and, and uh, school libraries like that. So the and that and and also sponsoring sort of like be a libertarian essay contest that would get people funded like the the yeah this infrastructure yeah. is actually very uh, i think it, i think it has been documented if you if I, I should look around for that maybe we'll talk about that more sometime sounds like yeah, a really cool. thank you idea. i appreciate that um yeah i was like i remember just so much like uh books in my high school ninth grade curriculum that was like why is communism awful like we read first they killed my father about the the Cambodian thing we read about about people escaping the gulag. So there was this like this drumbeat of communism is terrible, which in those cases, yes, but that's a weird tendency. And I'm wondering how that kind of curriculum was put together. Uh, the Cold War. Kind of like, yeah, the Cold War. It's also this. I would look at yeah. um, Ben Burgess has a new video on zero books. Mm-hmm. And he's got a book mm-hmm. that's going to come out, which is going to be really good called Li- Give Them an Argument Logic for the Left. And this video. It's called, like, Did Karl Marx Kill Millions of People? And he does a really (laughs) good logical and historical breakdown of why, you know, basically taking, like, the atrocious crimes of whether it's Pol Pot or, you know, things that happened in the Soviet Union and China as a proxy for uh, not reading Marx and not being, you know, an intelligent person is ridiculous. He also has a great one of my favorite factoids with him is uh, his answer to the and there's a lot to unpack with the Venezuela propaganda, but he'll always make the point that uh, more of the uh, French government, more of the French uh, private sector, more basically there's a bigger public sector and more government ownership in France than there is in Venezuela. And what I like is it was like you either are going to need to say acknowledge the obvious, which is that. You know, there's different, very different brands of what we call socialism, and some of them actually work very well in some ways. Yeah. Or you're going to have to just, you know, it, or if you're going to assert, no, no, France is really capitalist, then you're going to actually have to say, well, Venezuela is, in fact, definitely capitalist, uh, if you're being real about it. Mm-hmm. All right. I appreciate the call, man. Thank Another you. quick example yeah. I've mentioned before is Orwell has a quote from Why I Write that says, Every line of work I've written since 1936 in the Spanish Civil War. Uh, has been written directly or indirectly against totalitarianism and for democratic socialism, as I understand it. Right. And in the Penguin, uh, the um, a 1984 copy that was sent to schoolhouses around America, like tens of millions of copies of this they were in libraries, the, and for democratic socialism was uh, excised and put in, uh, under ellipses. Right. You can never just live. I mean, that this is the problem with so many of these, you know. Capitalism didn't win because of the marketplace of ideas, yeah, folks. Yeah, exactly. And there's never any just innate, you know, clean space. Everything is contested and controlled. Alex B. Hey, Michael, did Professor Wolf say on TMBS that he thought Corbyn should just unilaterally cancel Brexit? If I recall something like, this is not a, quote, this is not a struggle that the U.S. should be, that the U.K. should be indulging in right now. It was sold on lies and is unworkable, unquote. I think that is what he said. Yes, if I recall correctly. And it's true. It's precisely, absolutely. Secret identity politics. If you're not afraid of being any, uh, (laughs) if you're not afraid of being taken out of context in the future, how about a round of marry, fuck, kill between Sam Harris, Jordan Peterson, and Ben Shapiro? Uh, I am going to not play that because I do think I'll be taken out of context. So He's got no. a book coming up, folks. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. It's a great concept, though. It's a terrifying. It's it's like a Chinese water torture concept. Uh, I'm assuming you gentlemen do not want to indulge in that horrifying scenario. Whoa. What's up? Okay, uh, Disco Stu, I just want to point out that in light of the Tucker Carlson situation that Glenn Greenwald is digging in defending Carlson blatantly misrepresenting what censorship is. Considering he's a regular on Tucker and Fox, maybe time to question his motives a bit more. Unlike Mark Blythe, Greenwald certainly understands the problem, which Fox begs the question why he continues to go on them. Uh, look, I, I, Glenn Greenwald... Actually, let, let me, let me uh, say this for a minute. So one... Uh, I I think actually that there's a fundamental difference between kicking somebody off of a platform like Patreon, which I have 
a big problem with and very sincere concerns about versus targeting somebody's advertisers. That's a that's actually a completely different thing. Demanding that Fox News not have Tucker Carlson on their airwaves is a different thing than telling advertisers, and this is using market pressure and a smart way to use market pressure. You know what? I don't want to use your hand soap because your advertising white nationalist TV is fundamentally different than this person should not have access to a platform of which I'm outsourcing the ability to make those editorial decisions, a private sector company that already has monopolistic power. Totally different thing. And if I was to take it down a notch in a really imperfect comparison, I would never ask Patreon to take Sam Harris off of Patreon ever. But I would certainly ask a friend why they were patronizing Sam Harris, right? That's a very different thing. So that being said, I'll just say what I always say about Glenn Greenwald. Glenn Greenwald is a great journalist. He does a lot of really important work. The Snowden story alone. He was just on Amy Goodman the other day breaking down these anti-BDS bills in state legislatures, which are a massive, horrific threat on free speech. Glenn Greenwald is someone who I read, someone who I respect. And I completely disagree with him on his view of Tucker. He, uh, some of his we have contested beliefs about how to interpret some election results. We've, there's probably daylight between us on Russia. So we disagree. And that's okay. And actually, uh, one of the nice things about someone like Glenn is uh, he's aware of that we disagree. And uh, we're able to have that debate and conversation. And I, I would just advise in general, like, there's some really clear people like a Dave Rubin that is just out of the box, right? And it's just a pure political enemy in my estimation. Unlike uh, Glenn, I would say Tucker Carlson's like that. Uh, but in general, I don't think we should be looking for to have everybody be like that because at some point you're going to get pretty lonely. And Glenn Greenwald on balance, uh, just even in terms of his work, is still, if you're actually reading him, not just looking at tweets and tracking TV appearances... Uh, is doing a lot of really good work. And even his appearances on Tucker, I have problems with some of the framing. I get it. I do. And I wouldn't go on Tucker like he goes on Tucker. That's my public position from the beginning. I would only go on Tucker in an adversarial way. Uh, but he's talking about things like intelligence services and surveillance, which are important to him. Yeah, he does good. Really, yeah. He does good work from my perspective. He's obtuse about certain things, especially. I mean, he was obtuse on Twitter and in a pretty funny way. He literally drill subtweeted him. What did he say? Uh, 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 Greenwald did something about like if you tweet at somebody and say this ain't it, chief. You've almost certainly made a really clever point, and you should get a MacArthur Genius Grant. And then drill tweeted about MacArthur Genius Grants later in the night in a tweet that was very similar to Greenwald's meltdown. Uh, that's funny. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the Greenwald thing and the Tucker thing, yeah, I completely disagree with Greenwald. Every time he's on, I roll my eyes, and yeah. it's annoying. But unlike other people, like, he he does do good work. It's very good work. And I, I mean, there is there is something amazing, and, the, and I'll just take, like, with the, you know, these are these two polarizing figures. Obviously, I have very different feelings about them, and I do like and defend Green, Glenn Greenwald in many areas. Uh, others I strongly robustly disagree with them on, but there is something just incredible in the Twitter age that like Neera Tandon, who's the president of one of the most important think tanks in the country and Glenn Greenwald, who's an incredibly important investigative journalist and commentator are both primarily known by their Twitter riffs. And, you know, and I will say like, again, if you're reading Glenn Greenwald's columns, you're going to still find an incredibly rigorous, important person that you have to deal with, even if it's because you disagree and you just want to like hone your arguments, which is actually you know a good thing to do. Uh, I find uh, near attendance other activities uh, less justifying of her Twitter presence. You're calling from a three four seven. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, reminder: Republicans controlly control all three branches of government, and they're shutting it down themselves. Paul Ryan. Okay, we actually have to go to this. I'm sorry, caller. I'll get to you in a second. Um, give me, keep the call down because we have to do this. 
Paul Ryan says President Trump will not sign a short-term continuing resolution signed by the Senate. This means we're heading towards a shutdown. Uh, let's play this clip. This just happened. Now, uh, we just had a very long productive meeting with the president. Uh, the president informed us that he will not sign the bill that came up from the Senate last evening uh, because of his legitimate concerns for border security. So what we're going to do is go back to the House and work with our members. We want to keep the government open, but we also want to see an agreement that protects the border. We have very serious concerns about securing our border. So the president said he will not sign this bill. So we're going to go back and work on adding border security to this, also keeping the government open because we do want to see an agreement. With that, I'll turn to Majority Leader Kirk. Uh, we believe there's still time we could have border security. You know, fundamentally, that's what America is asking for. It's one of the fundamental jobs, especially for our president as well. We had a great discussion with him there. The president said what the, um, what the Senate sent over it's just kicking the ball, just kicking the can down the road. We want to solve this problem. We want to make sure we keep the government open, and we're going to work to have that done and get something done. So this is all lies uh, predicated on a crisis that doesn't exist. It's actually predicated on a crisis that now does exist because it has been created by uh, the barbarous policies of Donald Trump and the Republican Party. Good little side note example there. Paul Ryan 100% has his back. Paul Ryan is a functional white nationalist politician. Everybody who gave him any credulous coverage should watch that again and again and review his record again and again. I'm not sure this means shutdown, though, because I I still am of the mind that some type of, you know, Trump is of the face-saving symbolic gesture that he can exaggerate, bloviate, and lie about. Uh, so it's very possible that you'll see some type of dumb, you know, we're setting aside this amount of money for this type of wall, blah, blah, blah. Let's, you know, some cash that is obviously being completely wasted and is useless and will only add to hysteria around the situation, but can be like a political thing to kick the can down the road. So we'll see. It's nice that the media is uh, catching up to him a little bit, though, Paul Ryan. This, okay, uh, this is good. Bloomberg View, it's... um. Jonathan Bernstein, I think. Is, okay. Uh, farewell, Paul Ryan. He was unusually dishonest, a fraud as a wonk, and a terrible match for the job. Beautiful. People like us were saying this in 2011, but, you know, better, I mean, than, I, better late than never. For real. For I, real, better late than yes, ever. Yes, exactly. I mean, yeah. I would just quibble with, I think he's usually dishonest for a Republican, but he was, he was uh, yeah. unusually good at uh, tricking liberals into thinking he was right. honest. <laughs> That's what it was. But, I mean, yeah, he was just a loathsome fraud hack dishonest corporate bag man liar like the rest of them um oh let's just take this call then we'll go you're calling from a 347 area code who are you where are you calling from hello hi this is ali from astoria hey ali what's going on what's on your mind well i wanted to say something about the deplatforming thing but this shutdown thing um i'm ac I actually work for the government um oh, okay for the federal government it's a contractor and I just realized uh, we're not going to get compensated uh, for the shutdown. Uh, there's some talk about back pay, but as a contractor, you don't necessarily get that. So it, it's going to affect me and millions of other people yeah. uh, for something that doesn't exist. Something um, that doesn't exist. So there are millions of, of people who, even if it only happened, even if this thing, and I, I realize, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I must have missed, because I didn't, I didn't realize that the veto would immediately put this into effect. I thought that they actually had a, I, they must have a bit, they have a bit more time, right? The deadline's tomorrow. So look, if this well, happens. Well, we've been getting emails about this for a while. I'm sure. So if this, I just want to, I'll get back to you in a second. I just want to, uh, yeah, I want to be clear, because sure. I went clearly, quickly to the politics of it, and what a scumbag Paul Ryan is, which are both relevant things. But yes. If this happens, even for a day, even for a couple of days, it's going to massively harm millions of government workers and people whose livelihood depends on government, which is going to be bad for each and every one of them individually and for their families. It's also going to be bad for our economy, which there's already very strong signals that the economy is about to slow down, maybe even go into recession. And it's also going to harm all sorts of other people that rely on what they euphemistically call non-essential services, which actually are the most essential things government does, <laughs> like deliver food to people, like key social programs, which of course need to be radically expanded and increased and universalized. So if this happens, 
it is squarely on Donald Trump. It's squarely on Paul Ryan. It's squarely on the racism, xenophobia, conspiracy theories of everyone who has created a completely fake crisis. It was a crisis that didn't exist when there was net uh, positive migration, and it does not exist now that there is literally net neutral migration, and it will never exist because of people seeking refuge from crises generated by U.S. foreign policy and domestic oligarchies. It's disgusting, it's immoral, and it's going to hurt people even if it only happens for a day or two. So I want to be clear about that. Ali, go ahead. Yeah, uh, everything you said is right. Um, well, okay, putting that aside and me not having a job. Um, the deplatforming thing, I just want to add a little bit of historical re- reference. Mm-hmm. Uh, this conversation has been going on for uh, at least a century. Uh, there are references in black newspapers in the 1920s to uh, giving a dignified silence to KKK rallies and uh, the movement. Yeah. Uh, there's, there was a movement in the 60s called Quarantine by Jewish activists to uh, not pay any sort of, um, uh, not to vocalize or announce the movement of white supremacists. Um, so, I mean, these things that are, are going through the, specifically the left wing community, uh, it's, it's been going on for a long time. And I, I guess my I trouble tend is, to, I tend, in my yeah. trouble is, Ali, those examples, at least I, I support those examples and they don't implicate what I'm mm-hmm. criticizing and concerned about. You know what I mean? Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, so, yeah. I, I guess, I mean, I'm oh, sorry. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 no. Go ahead. Okay, last thing I'm going to say is that um, what did occur in the 1920s, as far as my reading goes, there's a great book called uh, Ku Klux Culture with a K uh, that uh, showed how uh, trying to debate people on, on that, the fascistic side actually increased their membership. Uh, and while ignoring them uh, didn't exactly do uh, anything to end the KKK, it, it, it then inflamed them. Um, and that's all I have to say. I'm with you on a lot of that. Okay. I think I'm mm-hmm. again, I, I think maybe it's, it's not being clear, but I'll say again, the challenge. Okay. So just two brief points and maybe Matt will articulate this better than me, but there's, there's okay. Number one, none of those movements, and none of those tactics ever implicated the First Amendment, right? Like they never said, we're going to put a ban on a particular kind of speech on a governmental level, which I, I don't support. I know there's people in a European context where they have been implemented and it's actually worked well. And it's a debate that I'm totally open to being persuaded on, but I don't support it as of now. What's happening now with these tech platforms, which is novel and has never happened before, is that you have a whole new media ecosystem of which everybody is reliant and plugged into that people are getting their news from in various ways. And these companies are monopolistic. They have way too much power. They have zero public accountability. And if you start to put a market pressure on them, they're the result is just going to be and already has started to be as in the Facebook case and even in the Google algorithm case. Listen to the conversation I had on TMBS with Matt Taibbi about this. Maybe that's a good place to start. It is structurally going to affect investigative, left-wing, adversarial journalism. That is what's mostly Mm -hmm. going to get hit. So my concern... And so I... I'm of the school, to be honest, that these platforms have such a big public consequence and such large implications. I think we should nationalize them. And frankly, if they're nationalized, then they would be protected by First Amendment laws. Right. And that is what I think should Mm -hmm. happen. But I think even barring that, there needs to be a much more strategic approach to how we deal with these platforms, because even as an example, take go in a purely capitalist direction. If there was a left-wing Patreon, as an example, that got formed and people knew about and people were going to use and it was real and it was happening, it was on the run, then people like us would go, well, we're maybe going to move over here uh, because we don't want to share a platform with you know, the alt-right or the soft alt-right or whatever. Uh, you could you know, introduce those market pressures, but those market pressures are not introduced now because certainly, I mean, in some ways it's, it's actually weird. I mean, 
Patreon is way more vulnerable than YouTube or Facebook or any of the other real serious monopolies, frankly. So a system where you are reliant on the good sense of private monopolistic companies who've already proven that not only are they incapable of doing this, they are active contributors to the problem is never going to work out well at all. It's going to have major damaging long-term consequences as it already has on Facebook with sites like Telesaur. And, you know, and so that's really the point. And, and again, Going after Tucker Carlson's advertisers, completely different ball game, totally different ball game, which I support a hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, that's why I think people are overplying the you know risk of slippery slope. Like I am not concerned about a risk of slippery slope when it comes to Tucker no, Carlson, no. and I'm not really concerned about a slippery slope when it comes to Patreon because I think the slope is, people are already getting slid off of those slopes, right? And it it uh, it hurts the yeah. left often because. You look at uh, Sam Knight from um, District Sentinel. He's always he's always, always banned, banned from banned Twitter. Twitter, and and like uh, Crimes of Britain, I think got banned from Facebook. Like these these organizations are looking for a reason to purge left wing things. So while I don't like look the Sargon, I don't, maybe we don't want to re- litigate it too closely. But my point is, I don't think the left should be focused on. Um, hall monitoring this, right? If if maybe the liberals want to do this and put pressure on like things like Patreon to like, hey, look at this Lauren Southern doing that. That's just fine, but I don't think it's our. That's not like where I want to pour the gasoline, really. Like, let's get Patreon to be more um, policing of this. Like, I, I I just don't think that's smart at this point in time. It's not a winning strategy while we're in the context we're in. And as I say, what's weird is I think one, like. One scenario that really solved this problem creates a whole other problem, which is free speech on these platforms. That is what would happen if we nationalize them. Uh, and then there's a whole other set of, you know, but then and then conversely, if you if you if you seriously broke up monopolies, then you could have a genuinely competitive playing field. And then you could say like, oh, YouTube is where they did the, the far right crazy Nazi algorithm. But we have this, uh, but you know, Vimeo, like just as viable a platform has its own massive audience and they're catering to different things. And we have market competition and we could go into different places. But as it is now, these companies are all powerful, have no oversight, no accountability. And if you go down the path of that, the right is going to flip it immediately back. And it's not a question of, would they do it anyways? Of course they would do it anyways. But the context in which they can do it anyways, if you don't see that it's aided by playing precisely that game, uh, then you're just not being strategic. And that's the problem. And again, we don't have to go in the future. It's happening right now. Look at Alternet, Telesaur, all of these independent news sources, sometimes doing very important foreign policy coverage. What's happening to them on Facebook? Look at Google. The story about the Google algorithm switching from relevancy to like metrics of prestige essentially meant that the example is instead of when you look up Trotsky, it's an article, I believe, in the New York Times instead of a Trotskyite website, which is what it used to be. If you don't think that that's rewriting the rules of the road in a way that favors incumbents and blocks access to, you know, independent and potentially left and radical thought, you're being. I like how Ehud Olmert says it, like you're being naive. So that's the point. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll just, I'll just say, I mean, I, I completely agree with you about the monopoly and uh, the attacks on left-wing sources. I mean, you just have to look at what's going on with Black Lives Matter's posts on Facebook. They immediately get torn down, especially if you post it like myself as a black person. Right. But I would I just go. say, I, would, uh, I mean, it's happening, but it's also, it's happening. And if the left, I'm, I'm thinking maybe if the left wing doesn't do the same, we're kind of leaving an arrow up in a quiver. And, and the last thing I'll say on this is that seeing Richard Spencer cry in a V blog or whatever about not being able to march outside or not uh, be able to have a living gave me a lot of happiness. And I just want to keep that going on. Well, I would uh, say I, I appreciate that. And I would also say that at least what led Richard Spencer to cancel those shows was uh, just adversary. It was other people exercising their First Amendment. And he, the tire got popped. And that's awesome. He's still on Twitter because he knows how to follow the terms of service while he promotes a genocidal agenda. 
And then there's other people. Sam Knight gets kicked off once a week because he calls a right wing pundit an asshole. That's actually kind of what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's what's going to yeah, happen. That's in all a, these yeah, places. exactly. But that's a good. That's a good. Um, I I got the same joy when I saw that too. Uh, hang in there, Ali. Thanks for the call. Um, all right, we're going to just play this briefly. I do want to talk about this because I did do this interview and I wasn't going to play a clip of it on this show because you can you know watch it on the other one. But there was a kind of stunning thing that did happen yesterday in Brazil a couple hours after this interview went up. And the reason this matters, even if you don't have the same level of investment, okay, I I think that Lula, as Noam Chomsky said, is is the most important political prisoner in the world today. Earlier this morning, I talked with Samuel Moyne who has a, a book out called Not Enough, Human Rights in the Age of Inequality, and he teaches a, a, a law at Yale University. Brilliant. And his critique is that modern human rights ran in tandem with neoliberalism so that structural economic questions were obscured because organizations went with the flow with global capitalism and focused on the most limited set of unacceptable and need to stop atrocities at the expense of broader conversations that also need to happen on inequality, on food, on human flourishing. And we talked about this corruption narrative as a similar thing. And in his language, he said, anti-corruption narratives are used by elites to undermine democratically elected leaders. And he said, unless you're talking about ballot fraud, about stealing elections, this stuff is not the main focus. It should not be your main focus if you have a social democratic concern. Unless it's a you know pure rampant, like you're stealing, diverting money from poor people to give to the rich, which is what formal policy in most of the industrialized and developing world just is. Um, and he talked about how you know, fascists have used, used this effectively. The anti-corruption probes of the 1990s in Italy led to the rise of Silvio Berlusconi. You put that on top of the fact that in Brazil, so in Brazil, okay, talk about corruption if you want to. The case against Lula is beyond flimsy. We're going to play a clip of this interview with his lawyer in a second. But any conversation about him is going to also have to involve, if you have a perspective of the world where you care about poverty, you care about health care, you care about dignity, the fact that this man led 30 to 40 million people out of poverty, that he expanded labor rights, he expanded indigenous people's rights, he did work on Afro-Brazilian rights, broader representation, deepening democracy, recalibrated Brazil's role in the world in a way that was more democratic, autonomous, and dignified. This is an incredible record in many respects. And the dismantling, the lawfare against Lula, the coup against Dilma, is the context of which the corruption and the austerity of the last two years in Brazil. And now this Bolsonaro government, which even some liberals are concerned about, because yes, it is part of the global pattern of fascism. And it will have a sustained result on the Constitution, on gay, lesbian, and transgender people, on Afro-Brazilians, as well as the agenda of austerity. So the case against Lula is the context for understanding this broader coup and a broader process of which threatens all of us in the Trump age. Yesterday, and I'm quoting now from Brazil Wire. Well, let me actually, I'll get to that in a second. I want to play this clip because Valeska Martins was on my show on Tuesday. Go please watch the full interview at the Michael Brooks show on YouTube. But she talked about how the media could feed stories in the public. Uh, media could sort of generate rumor mills, which could then turn into legal investigations without a sound basis. And that's also pretty relevant in light, not only in terms of what I'm going to get to, uh, what happened yesterday in a second, but I guess also bear in mind of uh, what our uh, uh, dim-witted uh, enemy, Dave Rubin, was saying earlier about how left-wing the Brazilian press is. Is it not playing? Sorry, guys. I don't know what happened. It's one second, Matt. You need a sec? All right. We'll get to that in one second. You just need a sec. Okay. Well, let me... Uh, here. Um, then we'll loop back to that in a second. Okay, you got it? All right. Let's go. Uh, falsehoods and such um, false reports uh, by the mainstream media in Brazil... Um, and these and these uh, stories actually became 
uh, legal procedures became crim criminal investigations, but it all was a actually uh, gave cause to these. Um, um, they actually violated the presumption of uh, innocence by President Lula, creating this uh, dim, uh, person that was demonized, demonized by the media and therefore could be investigated by anything that actually the population would not be able to process anymore, what the evidences were, what the real hard evidence, evidences were of corruption uh, or of uh, money laundering in his case. Um, then he was um, illegally, uh, um, he was taken uh, to an airport in March of t 2016, uh, where he had to give a deposition basically on, on his entire two mandates, uh, with no, no evidence whatsoever that would um, entitle them to, um, to investigate him. Um, and uh, from there on, it became... Um, uh, um, a matter of um, uh, investigations and judicial proceedings with frivolous, absolutely frivolous, uh, that um, every day would come out uh, in the media. So that's how that process of seating worked. And this is really dangerous, again, because while the judiciary has acted in a political and vindictive and double standard way against him, this gradual unwinding of the judicial legitimacy also helps facilitate the next phase of what could potentially happen there, which is a return of a more formal military dictatorship and rule, which, reminder, was only ended in the mid-1980s. This is a very young democracy. And yesterday, what happened was the following, and I'm going to quote now briefly from Brazil Wire, which everybody should be reading on the story. Army High Command meets Lula stays in jail. Who's running Brazil is the name of the piece. On December 19th, Brazil went into a frenzy at the news that Supreme Court Judge Marcel Marce Marcio Aurelio had accepted a petition from the Brazilian Communist Party from the Communist Party of Brazil that caused for the, called for the freeing of prisoners jailed while their appeal processes were still underway. Lula was jailed before his appeals were exhausted. This meant that former President Lula da Silva, recognized internationally as a political prisoner, would go free. Lawyers and legal scholars applauded the decision, so on. There's quotes supporting the decision. They go on to note that Lula's 73 and is being held in solitary confinement. Following, and then what uh, ended up happening was another judge on the Supreme Court uh, just sort of intervened and was able to supersede that decision. Basically, if one uh, member of the Supreme Court objects, the process can stop. And this other judge, uh, Tofoli, uh, basically essentially said, this isn't legal, this isn't necessarily constitutional, but we need to figure out a way to make it so. So we're going to delay a decision until the new year just to keep Lula in prison. And they note that at the same time that the high command of the Brazilian military held an emergency meeting to discuss the impact of a potential decision to release Lula. And then they go on to say, I'll quote one more time, the armed forces intervened in previous Supreme Court rulings to deny the former president habeas corpus. And it's unclear if the army meeting influenced Toffoli's latest move, but he was consulted by President-elect Bolsonaro on the appointment of General Fernando Azevedo as defense minister, who had previously served uh, as an advisor to Toffoli prior to the election. So that's just to say, again, the broader context of understanding the misuse and lack of sophistication of anti-corruption politics in a broader pattern of the rise of, fasci of fascism. Drain the swamp. Uh, Orban ran vigorous anti-corruption uh, campaigns. Silvio Bellasconi's whole political rise was predicated on 1990s Italian corruption investigations of which Sergio Moro claimed that he based the car wash investigations off of. Then there's the immense importance and treatment of Lula as a political prisoner and the lawfare against him. I think pretty clearly with the support of the Department of Justice because of anger over lack of privatization in the oil industry. I believe that interpretation. And then third, there's the way in which this gradual corruption of institutions and breakdown and election of a literal neo-fascist candidate 
can see in this case not only a resurgence of far-right politics, but potentially even military dictatorship in the largest country in Latin America in a new wave of far-right politics when we're seeing this pattern replicated in several other countries in Latin America and something sort of echoing a judicial version of the coups you would see in the 70s and 80s. So it matters. Please watch that interview. Please let people know about it. It actually really matters. You're calling from a 915 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hi, this is Susie from El Paso. Hey, Susie, what's on your mind? Hi. Hi. Um, so I just wanted to respond to something Sam asked yesterday uh, in a conversation with Ronald Reagan. Okay. About um, why the uh, restriction on immigration happened in the 90s. Um, and the reason for that is because it, it's basically, you know, something that was designed to not necessarily keep people from coming here, but really more to um, police the people who were already here, uh -huh. right? So the right. whole purpose of that was to discipline the labor force of Mexicans already here into being afraid, uh, for, you know, to not organize and do things that were going to... Um, compromise them as a subservient labor force right i think you're totally so, yeah, right are, do you to... have are you a lawyer or are you an academic do you have a background in this i am yeah i have a, a doctorate in borderlands history sweet um yeah. do you teach now uh, i do i teach high school actually oh very it's cool. hard to the academic job market is a nightmare so um, you, yeah. yeah unfortunately that's the best i can do right now if you have any resources or um, things that we should read about uh, the immigration legislation in the 90s, send it to majorityreporters at gmail.com. Okay, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll look into that. All right, much appreciated. Thanks. Okay, let's do our little, let's see, who do we start with? We start with Pinker. So Steve Pinker doesn't know history at least political history that's my main beef with all of these intellectual dark web people and usually their total lack of historical awareness leads them to if they're sam harris to support essentialist ridiculous views of islam which again i always have to reiterate does not mean that you cannot criticize islam or object to islamic forms of government it means that literally to talk about it as one monolithic uninterrupted thing is historically sociologically politically economically illiterate now steve pinker somebody handed him a copy of the niskanen paper that came out this week and the niskanen paper is like a a some type of think tank or nonprofit that put out libertarian libertarian and it's a new effort to get beyond the false choices of right and left and yet another and unending version of the essentially be be socially liberal and fiscally conservative <laughs> right have a give people some tax credits but also deregulate the internet's so cool this type of thing in and it echoes the dominant politics in the 1990s which was the third way and Clinton and Blair and Schroeder ruled the day. And, you know, it's basically like if somebody somehow got billions of dollars in hedge money to relaunch AOL dial-up service. And then they were like, this is the newest and most exciting form of Internet access in the world today, AOL dial-up. And it isn't just that it's old. I mean, obviously, some things that are old can be applied to today, but it's that that particular model uh, did not work. It led to the collapse of social safety nets, broadening income inequality, it deregulated banks, including Wall Street and City and London, which helped lead to the global economic meltdown. It compromised center-left parties across the globe, leading to their underperformance in the wake of the financial crisis created by Wall Street. And where it's being primarily practiced today, 20 years after its heyday, is in France, where Emmanuel Macron is sitting at about a 20% approval rating with massive street demonstrations going on because of his 
uh, moves to implement austerity and redistribute money to wealthy people. And this is, of course, exactly the time in Steve Pinker's history-free uh, embrace of whatever will confirm his instincts for hierarchical market liberalism found, and that is meritocracy, the third way, and all of these great goodies that, of course, are totally new ideas if you don't have a grounding in political history. And Steve Pinker quote tweets, this piece from, I believe, is it a, uh, is this a Ross Douthat Ross Douthat. Ross yep. Douthat. Fresh off his, we need to bring the wasps back. And I'm saying that as a Catholic who actually descends from wasps, but converted to Catholicism. Yeah. Fresh off of his, the wasps governed America better piece, has a new uh, column in New York Times, which is entitled, How Meritocracy and Populism Reinforce Each Other's Faults. And I didn't read the piece. I don't care to. The only pieces I'm interested about reading Ross Dolthot or like his, basically if somebody's making fun of his old sort of sex literature. Um, but Steve Pinker is to the rescue with the, the fallacy that meritocracy is a consciously chosen system. Reality. <laughs> it's what you get when you move away from cronyism, nepotism, racism, sexism, old boy networks, and other biases. Now, Stephen Pinker teaches at Harvard University, which still to this day, I think it's upwards of 30% of the admitted class in the most prestigious university on the planet, arguably, running a close second to Bates College, that those people have weighted admissions based off of their parents also attending Harvard or other family members. Like, literally, an old boy or old girl network at his institution. You could broaden it out and say that generations of wealth and being trained to take tests with outside tutors and resources, the time to study, the context to study, the social capital the emotional investment to think that you should be in the most elite institutions are all massive inbuilt advantages that shape your outcome in life and how you perform in this quote unquote meritocracy. Do we have that Jeet here qu uh, tweet? So, but I mean, this, I mean, this is basically, this is it. I mean, this, this is the problem with the Steve Pinker perspective in a nutshell, essentially. It's technological panglossianism. And it doesn't describe, it both has no description of the reality of the world we live in, where the likelihood of how well you do in life is far more determined by the wealth of your parents than anything else. And as Jeet here says Pinker teaches at a university where 30% of students are legacy admissions, where Jared Kushner got admitted because his family made a, do a huge donation. Of course, he thinks he lives in a meritocracy. Indeed, Jared Kushner in a book expose on the Ivy League admissions process was a case study where they actually got someone, I think from his high school, saying like, yeah, I have no idea how he, I mean, it had to have been the donation because there's no other way that this guy could have gotten into Harvard. So, but what's great is that, okay, this has no description and connection to the world we live in today yeah. where wealth is preeminent, where your outcomes in life have more to do with the income of the family you were born into than anything else. And secondly, if we were to live in a world that was governed on different metrics of meritocracy, and there should be a lot of different metrics of meritocracy, by the way, because I'm not all, only just interested in rewarding people that might be clever in school. I'm also interested in people's ethics. I'm also interested in what people actually want to do and contribute. In order to live, though, in a world closely approximating this fantasy, you would have to do one of the greatest radical wealth redistribution yes. projects in the history of human civilization. Yeah. In order to have meritocracy, you would need to have radical democratic socialism, or it is literally a fantasy. Exactly. Like, look at uh, Pinker's original uh, quote, the fallacy that meritocracy is consciously closed reality when it, uh, I can't, sorry. 
the the ver the fallacy that meritocracy is consciously chosen system reality it's what you get when you move away from cronyism nepotism racism sexism old boy networks and other biases and that's like what about right. inheritance what about inheritance and what about by the way all those other things that we haven't moved from like we would have to do a whole political project that you spend all of your waking hours opposing to get to that world where it could be a reality. And that's the problem when your only politics is just looking at current events and then reaching for naturalized, quote unquote, science explanations for them and you skip how all of this stuff actually gets made in the realm of politics, economics, finance, and how it's historically formed. That is literally where all the action is. So Steve Pinker's, he's goofy. Watch his interview with Mehdi Hassan. That was pretty formidable. All right, speaking of goofy, let's talk about Elon Musk, eh? Um, it's been a tough couple of months for Elon Musk. Uh, when we made fun of him, we used to get the most rabid cultists getting freaked out because we made fun of their hero. But he has so lit his reputation on fire that I'm actually at a point now where it's sort of like Kanye, where I'm like, leave him alone. This is obviously like a damaged person. Like, my beef with Elon Musk was how destructive the mythology of that position is in society is catastrophic. Not to just like torture a guy who's going through a lot of issues. Uh, so we eased up on Elon Musk, but now he is back in the news with the announcement that the loop tunnel has been released. This is apparently the project that would get you, um, what is this? Like, well, I had originally, I'm, I'm I'd confused originally seen by it. which one this was. Well, I had originally seen, I remember it as the thing that was supposed to get you from San Francisco to LA in like, like 20 yeah, minutes. I thought it was like San Francisco to LA but in 20. since talking about, in all of the talking about it that I've seen lately, it's like, this will feel like transporting within your city, which is sort of how subways. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I know another thing that does that. No, no, no. It's called this the subway. moves one car at a time. Yeah. And if you just go, four seats in it, maybe you know, six. And it's yes. and if you go back to Elon Musk's old stuff when he explained why he was looking for a car system, he's like public transportation. I'm paraphrasing, but like literally, like yeah. public transportation is kind of weird. Yep, you never know who you might sit next to. I'll find the quote after we play yeah. this video here. <laughs> Sam says from the couch, he invented something that's actually a little slower than a ferry without the view. This is without, the I was going to say, yeah. and if you're about to watch this. Ferries are one of my favorite forms of travel. They're not super practical, but they are beautiful. And going on like the Vineyard Ferry, and getting a beer and some chowder, it's awesome. It's really good. This does not look so fun. <laughs> but of course he would have this music. Oh, uh, yeah, this music is totally rad, yeah. Is this Mark Maron? So we created the fucking hyperloop. Okay, get ready to be blown All away. Right, guys. Get ready. This is not going to do well for claustrophobic people. Yeah. It looks like the tunnel that you go into Manhattan in, except like a lot smaller. A lot smaller. It's got a cool like black light on the top. It does have cool black light. If you want to like get a hookah. I would not trust being in this thing if it was constructed by elon musk yeah elon apparently it's <laughs> high speed car wash technology yeah it should watch sam your car. feeding the killer lines from the couch <laughs> elon awesome. was asked about earthquakes because apparently now you we know, got some mitt romney technology here a little car elevator car elevators oh i'm yep. familiar with this oh elon brilliant Elon was asked about earthquakes, and apparently this is true, that earthquakes aren't a huge problem okay. Under the deeper you go underground for tunnels. But I don't know if I necessarily want to be the one to trust that I in California. <laughs> never. Any technology that Elon Musk is a part of is going to need to have been in operation for like 30 years before I would get into it. I've made a new uh, 
underground submarine. I'm gonna come down and save you. I swear to God. Yeah. yeah I mean, there's gonna that one of those things is gonna collapse, and a bunch of people are gonna be stuck in it, and and he's gonna be on 60 Minutes crying, like I don't, I don't, I don't respect the SEC, and I know that we lied about the weight measurements, but it's just because it's so much pressure, and I was on Rogan. I'm sorry, except I'm not. And I took all the beeping off the forklifts because it was really annoying. Yeah, it was in the so factory. annoying. Yeah. Right. When you didn't do the proper measurements on the tunnels, was it because you wanted to go to Burning Man? That's creativity. You never understand how a business works. Jesus Christ. I wonder if, do you think for some people, this is going to like get them back on board? It's so underwhelming. I can't imagine seeing that and being like, this is what I imagined when he was talking about I mean, about I think ago. if you go to the replies, man, there's going to be a thousand people who are just like, awesome, dude. Great soundtrack. <laughs> you know what, though? The dirtbag left is well represented in those replies. Yeah, they are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good job, guys. Good job. Keep at it. You're calling from a 206 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? What up, Mike? It's Alex from Seattle. Hey, Alex, what's going on? Oh, uh, I just wanted to do uh, two quick things, a little bit of fun since it's a heavy, uh, heavy episode. Um, number one, I'm glad you discovered the uh, the Peterson uh, wants to bang his cousin story, <laughs> but unfortunately, you're you're leaving out the last part, which is really the best part. Oh, please tell me. I okay, should so say, after the bomb goes off, right? What? I just should. Maybe we should. Yeah. Reset the story for people, and also be clear that you're being satiric because uh, Jordan Peterson is a, uh, he's quite very litigious. Very litigious. But I'm not being satiric. This is what he wrote. He uh, yeah, word. Hella stories like this in his fucking thing. He wrote it, man. <laughs> not my fault. He's well, fucking weird. <laughs> give us a documentary evidence. Yeah, yeah. So tell us the story from his book. Uh, go ahead. Okay, so he's uh, he's doing hella drugs and freaking out when he's a little kid, and he has this apocalypse dream where right, he's sitting I'm, on the couch. I'm going to tell cousin. a story, okay? Because I remember this a little differently. So let me take the helm here, and then you can get me to the to the best part in a second, okay, buddy? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. All right. Here's the story. So Jordan Peterson is very terrified of a uh, an atomic apocalypse, a war, a cold war turning hot, which actually, like, uh, it would be nice if he had some of that fear today. Maybe you could do some videos about Trump pulling out of arms control agreements. But whatever, being that as it may, he's scared and having nightmares about something that's real. And he's interested in psychology, and so he goes to try to figure out what's going on, why he's having these apocalyptic dreams. And he reads Freud, and he goes, and Freud, just Freud, everything's sex. So it made no sense. So he rejects Freud, and then he that's how he discovers Jung, and he claims that Jung speaks more directly to it. And then, somehow in this process, he explains the dream that Freud had nothing to say about. And the dream is he's sitting on the couch with his cousin, who he does describe as being like very beautiful, maybe the most beautiful, most girl, beautiful girl in the world, most beautiful girl in the world. He's like, most beautiful girl in the world. And then they're sitting there, and then all of a sudden, there's a giant atomic explosion, which is pretty funny because it's like maybe Freud did have something to say about that dream, buddy. But anyways, go ahead. What, what was I missing? So after the bomb goes off, he's wandering through an abandoned, like the abandoned, destroyed world. Right. And he comes across this. He comes across this great meat, and he starts eating this meat, and he's like, "This is the most delicious thing I've ever tasted. Like it's so good." And then these wolves come up and tell him it's his cousin, and he starts crying because what he did was so wrong, but it felt so good. Are you serious? I don't remember this part. I, I have the book right next to me, man. I can read it to you if you want. Yeah, can you do sure, the voice? Bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, give us a dose. Okay, let's uh, give me a second. Take it off the shelf. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Such a huge fucking book. It is a huge book. Maps of Meaning is not user friendly. No, it's like a fucking textbook, man. Uh, <laughs> God damn it. So. 
and blah, blah, blah. Let's get, yeah, you know, my cousin stood up and went to the TV, a brilliant flash of light, the entire town, the star terrain. Oh, Alex, Alex, you after. need to speak into your phone. Sorry, can't hear you. Speak into your phone yeah, while you read can it. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's a little better. A little bit better. All right. It started to rain mud heavily. The mud, okay, blah, blah, blah. I was, he was wandering through the town. A few distraught and shell-shocked people started to gather together. They were carrying unlabeled and dented cans of food, which contained nothing but mush and vegetables. They stood in the mud. Some dogs emerged, one from under the basement stairs. They were standing upright. They were thin like greyhounds, and they looked like creatures of ritual. They were carrying plates in front of them, which contained pieces of seared meat. They wanted to trade the meat for cans. I took a plate in the center of it. It was a circular slab of flesh, and I ate it. Where did it come from? Uh, it tasted so good, but where did it come from? I had a terrible thought. I rushed downstairs to my cousin. The dogs had butchered her and were offering the meat to the survivors. Ew. I cried. Aww. Wow. And then I woke it makes up. You, it really makes you think, doesn't it? Yeah, it makes it? you think. And then I woke up, and I was sitting next to Dave Rubin. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the call, man. We gotta. That's horrifying. Wait, one second. I, I all right, real quick, because we were. I want to hear. Yeah, we're running tight, but go I want to. I have. I I know. I I love your voices. I have two like improv things. I hope you do. One is white supremacist Sam Harris gets mad that his thought experiment about having a white ethnoscape was taken out of context. And Jordan Peterson yells at his penis and calls it a cultural Marxist for being aroused by trans porn. Can you do it for me? <laughs> I think the second one's more promising. And then I discovered, All right, discovered that it, my penis was a cultural Marxist. Uh, it's a really interesting concept. <laughs> All right. Thanks for the call, man. All right. Final call today. Sorry. Cannot get to everybody. We're going to take one more call and then read a few IMs. You are calling for from a 240 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Michael, is that you? Yes. Hey, it's Vito from Maryland. How you doing? Ding, ding. ding. Hey, Vito, how's it going? I'm good. How are you? Okay. All right. Um, just a quick anecdote from a previous caller who was talking about the curriculum, um, and I guess he was in Texas, but um, I had read recently, <clears throat> I guess there's four, five or six red states i don't want, I want to say texas alabama mississippi louisiana and, and something else i don't know but basically they were getting rid of uh textbooks and not just textbooks but you know books like in their public libraries that um the school public libraries that they considered to be um sort of left in any way and mm -hmm. one of those books um that i know was very like instrumental when I was re very young it was like um, People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn and you know that was that was an important book for me at a very young age yeah um, yep 100% and they, they, yep. They they've, ban they've now they've banned it and, and you know thrown it out of all the schools down there but it's insane which is, which is a real shame but um, the other thing I wanted to say was you know, in, I was, your guest was interesting today. I think there's a problem, though, that's a little more fundamental, and that is, you know, I think there's there's too much of a reliance by too many people on these public, on these on these platforms and these, um, you know, social media for for their information in a, in a basic way. I mean. You know, if, if yeah, you are, I mean, I got to tell you, you know, I, I hear you, but I mean, I, we got to figure out how to reform and deal with those things now because the ship has already sailed on that. I, I think like 10 years ago, if people were thinking in a less market techno utopian way, there might have been some much better planning for these things. But uh, the horse is out of the barn and we got to figure out the world as it is now. And again, that might include some really radical reforms, but. Uh, you know, these platforms yeah. are going to be part of it. I appreciate the call, man. Thank you so much. All right, we'll read a few uh, IMs, and then we're out of here. Civil War base 
football letters. It's interesting how conservatives are stoking fear about disease among immigrants, yet they want to do away with food safety legislation so they can bring back Old West diseases you could get with play, with uh, while playing the Oregon Trail. I mean, is it really, though, interesting? Uh, Greg from Oklahoma. Sorry, I haven't called your show in a while, but I've been going through a really tough time, and I'm depressed this year. I'm dealing with it and getting through it. I miss calling into the show. Uh, love you, guy. Next time I want to talk about Congresswoman Kendra Horn. Thank you guys for doing what you do. Hey, Greg, hang in there, man. We appreciate you. and uh, Keep fighting the good fight out keep in Keep fighting the good Oklahoma. guy. You're a good guy, man. Take, you know, take care of yourself. You, you, we, we, uh, you have friends here at MR. You're an MR caller. caller Indeed. <laughs> Hall of Fame. Theodore Rosenmoji. Hey, did I mention that M- Abrams is at the center of American progress? Now, that's good, right? Yeah, I, I have no problem with Stacey Abrams going to the center of American progress. All right. Uh, that could be good. And the she final... She should. That was the only... It should be head of the center for American progress. Need some new leadership. Need some new leadership. And the final I am of the day. Echoing Matt Bullprog at the loop collapses. Elon can invent an impractical rescue sub and call the emergency team pedophiles. We'll see you tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught between the truth and the lie.